We're live. Let Coach Lerone sit down. I thought it was a cricket umpire coming in for a minute then. I thought, well, we got a game of cricket here this afternoon. How was that? Right, well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to a, I would have to say, a delayed environment select scrutiny meet, uh, meeting because we had to move it. So hopefully it hasn't inconvenienced inconvenience too many of you. So I'd just like to remind members and officers that this meeting is now being broadcast live to the public on the internet and recorded for view of Council's YouTube channel. Good afternoon, Jackie. So, I will now open the meeting, and before we start, I would like to take this opportunity to welcome to the new members to the Select Committee, Councillors Jackie Lay and Richard Budden. Welcome to you both, okay? Um, I don't have you on my list here at the moment, Horace, so I will have to double check that afterwards later on. Before as an official member. So before I welcome you, I'll have to double double check. I've got Kieran checking it. Right. Um, the first thing on the item is we have to, on the agenda is the election of a new select committee member, vice chairman, because obviously we know we've lost a couple of members recently. Um, sadly, Councillor Bob Jones and uh, our friend from Cowan, uh, Tony, so Tony Trotman. So, um, so the first, so can I have a any nominations for the selection of the vice chairman, please? Right, well, I'm going to have to nominate from the chair then because I am aware. Oh, sorry, Karen. I was going to propose uh, Derek Walters. So you proposed Councillor Derek Walters, and from the chair, I will second that. So, do we have uh, any other nominations? And as we do not. Then um, I will therefore declare that uh, Councillor Walters is duly elected the Vice Chairman. Welcome, Derek. If you'd like to come and move your place. Well, Derek, it's on the move. Um, Simon, do we have any apologies, please? Oh, yes, we have apologies from Councillor Charles McGrath, Councillor Nick Murray, Councillor Brian Matthew, and attending as his substitute is Councillor Stuart Pullman, and uh, I believe Councillor Ian McLennan is joining us remotely. And that's the most remote person I've ever seen enter a building. <laughs> So you're on remote. Obviously, you've must have flown in at super speed. Right. Thank you. So, so Roy, is the committee happy for me to move the minutes of the meeting held on the 11th of January 2024 as a true record? Uh, Councillor Jackson, um, I have a seconder. Um, Councillor Palman, thank you. Okay. Are there any objections? All in favour? Aye. Okay. Thank you, that is successfully moved. Right, are there any declarations of dif disclosable interest or dispens dispensations as granted by the Standards Committee? I can see none. Chairman's announcements, uh, there are no Chairman's announcements, but here I'm gonna give permission to Councillor Tony Jackson, who unfortunately has a prior engagement um, and is a little bit dub doubled up on his diary. so. There is an item on item 11, which is a written statement that he would like to do. And I said, oh, if I let you do it now, then when it's time for you to leave, you can. So you now have my permission to do that written statement. Uh, thank you, Chairman, and uh, thank you for your indulgence. I'm, I'm very grateful. Um, this is on behalf of um, the chairman of the um, task group, Graham Wright, who is not able um, to be with us today because he's on a dental appointment. So we've met twice, the Climate Emergency Task Group has met twice um, since the last Select Committee meeting. In January, we saw See Through Carbon. This is an organisation that supports carbon auditing and carbon reduction plans. It's a non-profit running a number of pilot projects with organisations and sectors across the world. 
um, the OECD says that, or estimates that, 70% of carbon produced by businesses comes from SMEs. So the first pilot for the group is in this sector. We talked about the importance of transparent and low cost carbon auditing and how see-through carbon operates amazingly without a bank account. Um, we also met with officers to consider the development of a new Wiltshire Council climate change adaption plan. The task group had commented on the previous plan, which was revised in 2016. So we looked at that in November 22. It's important that we plan to adapt the effects of climate change and the group is confident that there is a robust plan in place to deliver an effective document. So doubtless that is a subject to which we will definitely be returning in due course. Um, the task group itself, of course, is now three or four years old and the work continues. So um, it's not it's it's not a short lived it's not a short lived group. I think we've got an extension of the uh, task group's work um, by this committee um, last year, and uh, one would foresee that it will uh, continue. Anyway, um, Chairman, I'm happy to take questions if you want to give committee members the opportunity to ask questions. Okay, well, thank you for that then, Tony. Is there any questions of the members for Tony on that one? You were very lucky, Tony. No questions. Thank you very much. Item six is public participation. And there is no public participation. We've had nothing in. No? Okay. Thank you. Right, now we move to the main agenda items. Uh, this is the main part of the agenda. Now, can I please remind committee members during our forthcoming discussions to keep any statements to a minimum? Mate, I also ask members please to keep parochial questions to a minimum unless it is to illustrate a broader point about policy, services or delivery. <laughs> Usies will survive. <laughs> right, okay. Not Scotland. Right. Now, item seven, which is the Highways Annual Review of the Service of 2023. This is item seven on the agenda. It's the Highways Annual Review. It's, uh, it's pages 19 to 360 of your agenda pack. We welcome uh, Councillor Nick Holder to the Select Committee in his new role as Cabinet Member for Highways, Street Scene and Flooding. Um, so would you please introduce this item, uh, Mr Holder, Councillor Holder, because we have, we may also be probably joined by Parvis and uh, Samantha and Dave Thomas, but Nick, and the team, welcome. Thank you, Chair, um, and um, thank you for your for your welcome. Um, Obviously, you need to point out that the uh, papers in front of you do have my predecessor's name against them, um, Councillor Caroline Thomas. And before I introduce the paper, and, and it's a relatively short introduction, uh, I'd like to take the opportunity to pay tribute to the work that uh, Caroline undertook um, in her cabinet responsibilities previously. I know that tributes have been paid to her um, both by the leader and the cabinet yesterday. But I think we should be uh, grateful for the efforts and hard work that she's put in. And I think the, the honesty that she's um, used and the integrity that she's shown when she's been presenting papers about, about highways. And so I'd like to um, put that there, if I may, Chair. Um, I'd just like to read a few notes, if I may, that I've made. Um, the, the papers that you've had, and I use the word papers uh, in a, in a advisedly the nearly 250 pages that you've had um, cover the annual report on on highways asset maintenance across nearly five billion pounds worth of assets over nearly 3,000 miles of carriageway 
And I think it's important that we understand the context of, of what it is we're dealing with uh, within the, the highways team. And I'd like to thank officers for their hard work in pulling together such a comprehensive and informative report. And I do mean informative. I think you can see it's comprehensive by the size of it, but I think it is really informative. And I think there's some real, real nuggets in there um, that we need to take away and share with our, our residents and share with our, uh, our wider group of elected members. Before touching on a, on a few points to highlight, I'd also like to express my gratitude to everyone in highway service for the work they do, from filling potholes and cleaning drains in the pouring rain, dealing with the nearly 24,000 permit requests we receive every year, and the too frequently poor performance of utility companies. And I think it's important to understand that the utilities companies do have the ability to dig up our roads, dig up our pavements without giving us huge amounts of notice. And inevitably, uh, and unfortunately, there are instances where they turn up, dig up a hole, cover it up poorly and go off and cause disruption to our residents. And we have no jurisdiction over that. And I share the frustration of our residents and I share the frustration of, of officers and, and our many, many members who, who make those comments. We also, the officers also respond to the hundreds of queries we receive on aspects of the service for members of the public and the press. Uh, I've been in post for two days and I am not quite literally overwhelmed, but surprised by the amount of correspondence I've already had asking for issues relating to um, speed assessments um, uh, from um, helping some toads cross the road in Warminster and all sorts of interesting, varied and time consuming um, issues. Looking back to 2023, because this is the annual report, may well have been one of the toughest years for our highways team, dealing with the winter of 2022-23 after the baking hot summer started the recent cycle of material highway deterioration we are now facing, followed by the 23-24 winter's record-breaking rainfall, which has and is still adding to the difficulties we face in maintaining our highways, while also which also bring flood related troubles to hundreds of residents in their homes or while they're trying to navigate closed or dangerous roads. We are probably all aware of the level of criticism the council receives in this regard, but I think we should also be aware of the huge challenges faced and the dedication of staff trying to resolve them with the resources available with a continual focus on safety and to ensure that in our minds as councillors when we talk to residents. Um, I'd like to sort of digress, you know, th th it's interesting to note um, some local activity that's been taking place in an area where I live, where there's been some work being done to a, um, a refuge across the busy A350, which has caused the A350 to be closed at night, which has caused some issue with residents' ability to get to and from Melksham to Chippenham. I'm allowed to be parochial. The point I wanted to make is one of the reasons why that those works are being done is to improve the quality of the refuge for pedestrians across the busy A350. And all too often, we only hear the side from the people driving cars and don't understand the issue for those pedestrians, their ability to walk across the A350 in a safe way, parents with buggies, elderly people who have issues of mobility who need to cross that part of the A350 to do their daily shopping. And I think sometimes we do need to bear in mind not just the issue of people getting to A to B quickly, but the safety of our residents crossing our main roads. Funding is improving and it will make a difference over the next 12 to 18 months. But there are no magic wands. So I'd like us all to stay cordial and constructive in helping our officers tackle the challenges. It's a real endeavour for them. They're great at what they do and they're enthusiastic and passionate about what they do. So just briefly, a few points to note re-performance, communications, contractors, technology and recruitment. I just want to remind everybody here that the highway's performance is not just reviewed annually. We have bi-monthly POG meetings are used to present and discuss performance using an array of data to demonstrate both the amount of work undertaken 
and how we are performing relative to prior periods and benchmarks. Assessing performance is the crucial third leg for effective performance that starts with having a plan and ensuring it is as well funded as possible. We have used some of this performance data when out on the road over the autumn and winter at the Highways Matters event. And I'm going to my first Highways Matters event in a couple of weeks time uh, down at the area board in Stonehenge. And fortunately for me, that's the final one of the events where I've managed to skip most of the ones that uh, Caroline went to. Um, and, and you know, those events where we can share information with residents and listen to their views. It's been a tough ask of officers but demonstrates the openness and transparency of the council and has played an important role in the communication task, which I believe is so important for residents and businesses. They need to have a reasonable appreciation of what we do and how we go about it across a service that affects their everyday lives. I've had a very brief introduction meeting with Sam this week, and I have stressed how important I believe the communication of what we're doing operationally is not just to us as a council, but to our parish councils, our town councils, and importantly, to our residents. And I've already asked Sam to have a look at how we can improve the network of communication by using all of those um, bodies available to us, and also using the area board chairs as a way of communicating, and also using our LH Fig officers who work with the area boards. We cannot communicate enough to our residents and our elected councillors about what we are doing on our highways. It's imperative for me that our residents understand why we're doing things, where we're doing them, and how long they're going to take. And I hope you will see a significant enhancement in that level of communication as we move forward. We are, of course, very dependent on our contractors to deliver much of the maintenance work for us, and they are noted in the report. Their performance and value for money is managed via the contracts management process using KPIs and is perhaps something that councillors might want to look at in more detail going forward, particularly given the sums of money involved and the council's reputation that in effect sits with them. Linked to this is the use of technology. You will be delighted to know that Milestone will soon be introducing a dragon patcher to work on our roads, following careful consideration of work in neighbouring councils. No one bit of kit does the whole job. But speeding up physically hard and time consuming elements can only be a good thing. They're not just boys toys that the highways engineers play with. And we're also now using AI supported tools for scanning carriageway surfaces to help assess their conditions for future works. I can't mention technology without mentioning my wilts. And I know later on in the agenda, there's a more detailed presentation from my colleague, uh, Councillor O'Neill. We have seen an improvement in this vital reporting tool to improve the feedback. And I will continue to press our IT colleagues on how vital it is to have an effective tool, not just to help us identify defects, but to keep residents engaged in that process. I know the level of frustration that I personally have and hear from other residents and indeed other councillors about our residents not understanding how an issue that is reported on a multiple basis comes back with an issue closed message and be assured that's one of the first things i've been talking to councillor o'neill about of how we can improve that whole reporting structure but more to come later on in the agenda this also brings me to the level of technical expertise involved in meeting the legal technical and financial challenges presenting in managing all our highways assets and associated with this complexity the impact of carrying in vacancies and the importance of recruitment. I'm not sure if it's widely known, and I didn't know this until I had a conversation with Sam on Monday. In Dave Thomas's area, we have 15, 16 apprentices working in your team. I think that's right, isn't it, Dave? We have 15 slash 16 apprentices working in the area. That's fantastic for, that, for us as an organisation to be front and centre of training the highways officers of the future. It's great for employment opportunities that we are creating apprenticeships and it's great that we can put additional resource into our highways assets team, all of which shows how committed we are as an organisation to create apprenticeships across a wide area as possible, but also how focused we are on delivering additional resource in, into the highways team. The issue of recruitment is an industry-wide challenge, which we are tackling with our partners, but we should expect it to remain an ongoing challenge. 
But I make no bones about repeating the issue about apprenticeships. That's a great way to grow our own staff without having to go out and recruit from the external market, which lots of other local authorities are doing. Let's hope our reputation for being a well-managed, financially robust council helps both attract and retain the talent that we need. On that note, I'm sure you've all read, it, all read the 250 pages that you've had, so I'm happy to open the discussion up to questions. Thank you. Right. I don't know whether any of your officers want to do their present at this stage. I think you've done a very good job there. So you said it wasn't going to be very long. Well done. So now then, I am going to open it to questions. Um, so we'll have a little look around. And I, before, I, I do remember our new member, Councillor Budden, had previously raised questions regarding highway maintenance. So I'll call you first, Councillor Budden, and then put your hands up if you want to speak, and I'll um, put you in. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, first of all, Chairman, through you, may I say, I'm not sure uh, to Councillor Holder whether to offer my congratulations or commiserations. Congratulations on uh, saying goodbye to the issue of waste management and, and food waste segregation and being harried by me on that on every occasion possible and uh, moving into this seat and taking over the highways portfolio. Um, and let me also say that I uh, thoroughly sympathise with uh, some of your opening remarks and your comment about the pressure of messages from members of the public coming in. And uh, like you, without wanting to appear parochial, let me just refer, we will all have our own experiences in this respect, but uh, I had uh, yet another uh, resident call me in the last 24 hours to say that they were doubting whether they ought to pay their council tax because the issue of road breakdown in the particular area where they live was so severe. Uh, all of that, I, I hope, I, I say that um, merely in order to illustrate the gravity with which the issue of road maintenance, highway maintenance, uh, is taken by residents in rural areas, not only my area, but also I know particularly around Chippenham, for example, in the villages there too. Uh, I, I do have two or three specific requests or questions to put, but I'd like to, if I may, Chairman, with your indulgence, provide a little background to that. Um, I've got it all printed out in front of me, but if you want to know the references, if you go to page 95, uh, the introduction to the um, highways uh, investment plan for 24-25, uh, you'll see the statement. The county's roads have mainly evolved over the years with only a small proportion having been designed and constructed to accommodate modern loadings and traffic volumes. In the past, there's been underinvestment in maintaining the highway network nationally, which resulted in a backlog of maintenance and consequently road maintenance has been a challenge, especially in extreme weather conditions. And that's picked up on page 108. Most C-class roads are evolved roads that have not been purpose built and are clearly more susceptible to damage in wet conditions. The A and B class roads carry more traffic, but over the years they've been generally improved or strengthened. And the same could have been said, uh, the same as was said about C-class roads, could have been said about unclassified roads. Um, so I would make the point in passing that we've been repeatedly warned for well over 20 years now, for a quarter of a century virtually, that a consequence of a warming planet is that the atmosphere will hold more moisture, and the consequence of that is that our winters will be wetter, storms are going to be more intense. We can't say that the problem of road breakdown under uh, extreme weather conditions was unforeseen. Ergo, there's a need to address the underly underlying fundamentals that many rural roads uh, are not fit for purpose and need rebuilding by a, a developing a plan to do so and clearly differentiating our work. Uh, so that we can see and prioritise appropriately. And I think that's the purpose of the definitions that are set out in this uh, plan on page 131. The lengths of road treated are reported to the Department for Transport uh, using the following treatment definitions, strengthening, resurfacing and preservation, three distinct categories. 
But just to drive the point home, uh, Wiltshire has neglected to maintain its roads adequately. Uh, if you turn to, uh, oh, I've lost the page reference. Uh, if you turn to the following page, our return to the Department for Transport showed no spend on strengthening last year. 80% of our spending was on the relatively superficial tasks of surface dressing, microservicing, preservation and rejuvenation. Zero on strengthening or rebuilding, according to this report. And when we turn to the coming year's budget, similarly, all the emphasis is on resurfacing, which is indeed necessary. And I'm delighted to see that the budget for pothole repairs has increased £2 million. But on page 137, it makes quite clear all the emphasis is on road surfacing and zero on the underlying rebuilding need. The table lists proposed expenditure for road surfacing types. I have to, I have to admit, to be fair, it does include in the middle with the, in the middle with the rest the major repairs to line and banks, which strikes me as quite fundamental rebuilding and shouldn't have been included in the list of, 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 of uh, surfacing. But even if you exclude line and banks, two thirds of the year's budget is on surface treatments of one kind or another. Much of the rest is taken up with things such as overheads and consultants' feeds and bridge maintenance. Um, and uh, uh, given that one definitely, the, the, the old adage says insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. We should anticipate a repeat of this year's experience whenever in future there's a repeat of this year's weather conditions, which is to say more frequently. Councillor Budden, I've given you yeah. five minutes. If you just don't I need to get to some questions, well, I appreciate that. So if you so, could do that then for me, that'd be great. Uh, Thank I, you. I would, I would argue that we need a strategy for, for rebuilding the roads. That's, that's the first point. And to do that, I would ask that this plan should be represented to clearly set out and distinguish between underlying strengthening, resurfacing and presentation. Building on councillor, uh, the, the, the councillor's remarks about communication, I believe it is important to provide details of expenditure incurred over the last year under those headings for each area board. And I would request that the, uh, the, the plans for the future should be set out providing budgeted costs for each line item and in such a format that they can be sorted by parish so that we can communicate clearly with our residents how much is being spent in their areas and exactly what is being done so that they can see why they should pay their council tax. Okay, so there so is a couple of questions embedded in there. So would you like to respond to that, Councillor Holder or Sam? I'll respond to the, the point about council tax. Um, Councillor Budden, you, you've made the comment on a couple of occasions about residents not wanting to, you know, not want to pay their council tax. I have to say, you know, I do think you have a responsibility as an elected member to explain to your residents what their council tax is used for. And you can sit there and pull faces as much as you like but we have set out a very clear breakdown of how the council tax that is raised from residents is spent. And something like 10% of that goes on our roads, 10% of it goes on our waste. The vast majority of it goes to spend on our adult social care and look, our looked after children. And you have a responsibility to explain that to your residents, that there is not an opt-in or opt-out of council tax. It is a legal requirement to, to, to pay for it. And the final point I want to make, and I'm sorry to make, make a political one, there were no amendments brought forward to full council by the Liberal Democrats to increase spending on highways. So you can sit there and complain, but until and unless you come forward with an alternative financial proposal, I'm afraid the budget that has been signed off and the allocation that has been made going forward will remain as it is. I do agree with you, your point about communication, it can be better. Councillor Lay, it's your turn. Thank you. Sorry, I'm not very good at giving great long speeches. I, I'd like to be more to the point. I was going to say I was pleased to hear about the communication because I think that is something that um, people need to know. Um, 
particularly where we've been cutting down trees along the sides of roads and people are quite upset about that. We need to be clear why we've done that. And I was going to make the point that 9% of our council tax goes towards highways because the majority of it goes to look after our um, vulnerable adults and our children. Um, you know, are we going to stop looking after them? And I don't think that's going to happen. Um, and as Vice Chair of Children Select, I think we'd be really upset um, if um, children weren't looked after properly. Um, so the point I was going to say was about keeping the residents informed. I was really pleased to hear that. Um, I also heard at the area board that we're looking at our freight routes. And I think that that's really important because that's where we can get the major big traffic off these rural roads, which were built for, in Molly Groom's words, built for cart and horses. As you probably know, she was always saying that. Um, she put the cart before the horse. <laughs> <laughs> um, the other thing is, is that we, we collect the sills. I wonder, with our sill money that we're collecting, that's supposed to go on wider infrastructure. How much of our sill money can we actually identify as being spent in our highways budget? Because um, presumably our highway budget does include those sill monies somewhere. And going back to strengthening roads, um, Perton were very, very lucky um, many years ago. I don't know how many years ago now, but it, it doesn't seem that long ago. Um, because the B4553 at Watkins Corner was strengthened and it was because the HGVs, which go to the landfill site, were undermining the ditch system and the road was collapsing and they did a major, major work. So, you know, a bit of a, a, an advert. We do do these works, but um, we have to work within our budgets. And he responded, uh, Sam, with Leighton 2 freight, I think. Yes, just to confirm, we're pre moving forward with the uh, review of our local transport plan. We have an adopted local transport plan, but LTP4, as we call it, will include prioritisation of the freight strategy review. Um, just picking up your sill point as well, I'll take that away and need to confirm um, in terms of allocated spend to highways. Right, so I've let the two new members open up and have a little go and <laughs> try and keep it to questions. It's more about a Q&A thing here today and not so much about brokers and to be fair, so um, and you'll see now by our experienced members how we do it. Councillor Wallace, you're next. So not usually referred to as an experienced member, so thank you very much. Um, firstly, thank you to uh, particularly to, to Sam and her team for the uh, for the report, and I have read it uh, all of it, all of it. Um, and also thank you for the work recently in, in devices and the communications around that have been very good. And, um, you know, from having a lot of complaints and upset in the town, we're starting to get on a bit of a, a uh, level playing field again. Um, what I wanted to talk about really was drainage um, and, and drains and flooding. So in a previous meeting, uh, we talked about there being a, uh, a backlog in clearing out some of the drains and getting back to a, a, a somewhere we can start from because a number of them have been missed for a number of years. And to be slightly parochial as an example, um, so Indivisors actually took a uh, highways engineer around on a tour of the drains. He's, he's since left the role, which I'm sure isn't connected at all. Um, but uh, we looked at some of them and they hadn't been cleared for years. And some of those are now started to be cleared but we've got a really random approach there. There's one on the A342, which I walk past every single day on Nursteed Road on the Brixteed Avenue Junction. Walk past it every day. When it rains, I get absolutely soaked going past it. It hasn't been cleared. I've lived there since 2009. I can't remember it being cleared in that time. It certainly hasn't been cleared since I've been a councillor since 2021. Very recently, I walked past a crew clearing a drain about 100 metres away. Um, and uh, not long before that, I walked past some clearing about 100 metres in the other direction. And I don't understand why we aren't sort of hitting things in, in, a, in a sequence. Uh, and when I spoke with the previous highways engineer, he was talking about arranging a, a devises day, arranging a discretionary tanker to come to clear all the ones which were, you know, 10 years or more blocked. Uh, and I wonder, is that something we are considering? 
and is there a plan for for catching up so that we can then go forward on the the normal cycle thank you and, and thank you for your feedback on devices highway matters um Absol absolutely. So it has been incredibly challenging, um, particularly because of the prolonged extreme weather and our response in terms of um, storm Henk uh, across the whole of Wiltshire. Um, very much um, refers to Councillor Holder's earlier comments in terms of the forward work programme, the additional investment that has been provided for drainage improvements and working with area boards to understand the local priorities. So clearly we have a scheduled regime and we have a reactive response, ensuring that we are targeting local investment in, in a better way, particularly with the new resource that we're able to bring into the service and the new equipment. So further details to follow on that, but very much through the uh, area board process. Councillor Wheeler. Thank you very much indeed, Chairman. I'm trying to um, understand the figures that are quoted in this report. If you look at page 22 in paragraph 12, which is the annual review of service, you say here that in 2023, you resurfaced 32 kilometres of road and some footways, retextured nine kilometres of road, and surface dressed 63 kilometres of road. I add that up to be a total of about 104 kilometres, or 64 miles in old money. And I then turn back and find that Wiltshire Council is responsible for a highway network of over 2,800 miles. Now, either that figure is absurdly low or I mean that is if that is all that has been done that is a wholly inadequate response to the length of highways that we are responsible for and that includes obviously A and B roads and it obviously includes the C roads and the unclassified roads down which I have the misfortune to live uh, which has um, potholes that we report and periodically get filled up and then promptly float down the road again um, mainly because the drainage um, is bad and I entirely accept that on some of the country roads you are not dealing with drainage problems, you're dealing with um, basically um, the water table rising to such an extent that the water is actually coming out through the road surface which is something we can do very little about. But what I am concerned about is that to deal with this problem we need to come up, to my mind, with a programme that involves rebuilding, effectively rebuilding roads such as they are suitable for use. And then you will not be dealing with 15 or 20,000 potholes because the roads themselves will not deteriorate to that extent. And I would love to know the history of potholes on the roads for which Highways England are responsible for. And I know I will be told that their budget way exceeds ours. And it strikes me that we as a council should be putting pressure on central government, regardless of its political persuasion, to actually put in, and I'm going to use the word, tide funds. In other words, funds that are given to councils for highway maintenance, which have to be spent on highway maintenance. And that includes highway rebuilding. Thank you, Chairman. Any response to any of those? Uh, or is that mainly Sam? Thank you, Councillor Wheeler. Um, yeah, Dave probably wants to come in and say a little bit more in terms of the specific detail around uh, the types of prevention work we undertake and, and how we um, allocate those. But just to uh, remind ourselves, we make evidence-led investment decisions given the extent of the network and we have um, a highway safety inspection manual which follows a code of best practice and Department of Transport guidelines, which sets out how we have to mitigate risks on the highway, particularly in highly trafficked routes, so on the A and B roads, absolutely. So I think that the figures you've quoted um, are seen in the proportion of the overall network, as you say, and there is certainly more we can do in terms of the additional investment that has recently been um, received. Dave, did you just want to add in something? Yeah. So Yes, that is an accurate figure. Yeah, that's that's activities that are taken under planned um, maintenance activities. Alongside that, we have the patching and reactive program. So more surfacing work will take place, but those those fall into the reactive um, categories. Um, touching on on budget overall, uh, as Sam has mentioned. 
um, Department for Transport, uh, upon cancellation of HS2, have made additional funding available to us that is set out in the in the Highways Investment Plan document. Um, that funding is ring fenced for highways maintenance activities. It cannot be used for any other activities whatsoever. And alongside that, the DFT have introduced um, a much more restrictive uh, uh, reporting regime that we have to go through moving forward because they want to be reassured that we are actually spending the money on highway maintenance and they want to know the exact locations and what it is that we're doing. So we are getting there in terms of that side of things. Uh, but as you've rightly pointed out, the network overall is 2,800 miles and we're managing to do a relatively small amount of surfacing each year, but that is uh, the way it is with the budgets that we have available to us. Okay, so I don't want to ask that in percentage terms, it's about 3%, 3.5%. Okay, Ian McLennan. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, yeah, mine's a simple one. Uh, my road was resurfaced, and this is not a parochial thing. Uh, my road was resurfaced a year ago and other roads around Salisbury have been refurbished and I've noticed that when they were resurfacing they do two halved which is understandable because you let the traffic go through but when the bit in the middle isn't perfect and what happens is when the weather comes it breaks up and I just wonder whether that is like a an agreed outcome to road surfacing or whether there should be a, a like a smooth over so there is no join at the moment they're, they're, all the roads seem to be ending with a join where the white line would go down and it just seems to be a, like a, a false economy if there is one when the, when the guys are out there resurfacing uh there will be a join between the two sides of the road um, it's unusual to surface both sides of the road at the same time in one pass. Um, what we do is we look to make sure that that joint is sealed in a way that it doesn't deteriorate, but it is always going to be a weak point where you have a join between two layers of surfacing. Uh, so that's why it tends to deteriorate there uh, ahead of the, the rest of the uh, resurface mat. It's something that we do follow up with uh, and look to make sure it doesn't happen, but it's always going to be that weak spot where things will deteriorate more rapidly. OK, thank you. Derek, Council of Orders. Um, right, firstly, I'd like to thank Councillor Holder for um, very, an very excellent uh, introductory um, or introduction. And I say, and uh, I was interested that you emphasised this um, communication uh, issue. And one element of that I would consider would be actually um, the signage that takes place on when when road maintenance is taking place, um, because I, w I have to say that um, sometimes the uh, the fact that you get a, a sign which says road ahead closed, but actually it's a side road ahead closed, or uh, you've got a diversion, but it's not telling you um, where you're diverting from. So I'm trying to get to Chippenham. Where's there a Chippenham diversion? I'm trying to get devices. Where's the devices? Would there not be some opportunity here to improve that? And then that in itself would improve uh, the standing of highways in the community. Thank you. Uh, th thank you um, for that. Um, I don't know whether you noticed when you were speaking, Sam and I were looking at each other. It's when, when I had a, com as I say, I had a very short initial briefing session with, with her on Monday. And I did talk about, when I talked about communication, I did include the signage that we put up. She's nodding her head. I've said that we need, from my perspective, we need to be clearer. We need to give better reasons as to why we're doing it, how long it's going to last, uh, and, you know, be better at, the whole kind of I see signage absolutely as part of the communication how how we can be better but thank you for raising that point specifically but it is on the list of, of things to do 
I would, if I may, Chair, just like to respond to one point that, that's been made around, you know, rebuilding all of our roads across across the whole of the county. And, you know, we all need to understand that the majority of funding that's spent on highways comes is allocated from central government. And, you know, we've had an allocation of £20 million. The rebuilding of line and banks alone is going to cost nearly £4 million. Some of that has come from highways budget. Some of that has come from what's commuted sums. But if, we are se if you are seriously asking us to rebuild the whole of the roads across the county, you are talking about hundreds of millions of pounds. And unless we have a transformative government in the next few years that finds a way of raising a significant amount of tax without bankrupting the economy, it is ju just not realistic to ex expect central government to give hundreds of millions of pounds to every single local authority to rebuild the roads. And I'm sorry if that's not what people want to hear, but it's a fact of life. It, we, are, we can only spend what is given to us by central government. Of course, we've had some additional funding that Dave referred to from the um, HS2, the extra five million pounds. And of course, we as a local authority, because of our uh, financial management, have been able to put an additional £10 million into the highways budget. But as a sum of money compared to what it would need to rebuild our roads, it literally is a drop in the ocean. And we need to be really clear that they're the sums of money that we're having to deal with. Mel? Thank you. Um, I've got a memory in uh, from the last meeting about someone talking about different types of surfaces. Um, that would be better able to cope with the changing weather. I just wondered if you could tell us a little bit more about whether that is something that we're looking at and what that looks like and if it's more expensive to use and all of those kind of things. Yes, I'll make a start and then I'm sure Dave will come in because he's better placed in terms of the technology. But just um, I think we spoke at the last meeting in terms of innovative techniques and through our collaboration framework, which we have with our term consultants who are Atkins, but also all our contractors, we are always keen to look at options which are available to improve um, asset management as a whole, and particularly future life costs of asset management. So that's partly in terms of the, the kit we use, uh, and Council Holders already referred to the Dragon Patcher, which is going to be out on the network over the next few weeks, but also around um, different types of surfacing, uh, and be that reactive and preventative as well. So when we undertake cold and hot fill, but also making sure that when we're going out and using them, I'm not going to. I'm going to not going to call out a particular material because um, Dave said we're exploring lots of different options. Put it that way, Dave. Do you want to add to that? Yeah, thank you, Sam. Um, yeah, in the um, the report that's in front of you, there is a section um, that, that that is entitled innovation. Uh, and that does set out some of the work that uh, we're working with our contractors to do in terms of material choice um, that will give us better um, performance of that material over longer periods of time. It's also worth saying that within the um, construction industry and in the supply of um, blacktop type materials, there is an awful lot of work going on about carbon net zero and carbon reduction lowering the um, laying temperatures of materials um, to reduce the overall impact of, of, of carbon. Um, but alongside that is looking at the, the types of um, binder, the materials that go into the binder, polymer, modified binders, um, that will hopefully give us better performance moving forward. Of course, there is always a, a potential penalty that we have to pay um, in, in terms of additional cost, but also um, the, that might involve different laying techniques um, that might mean that the material takes a longer time for it to cure before it can be re-trafficked uh, and elements such as that. So we have to take that all into consideration when we're looking at the locations that we're doing. Um, clearly, we do an awful lot of work now uh, on the major maintenance schemes overnight during full road closures for safety of operative purposes so it, it, we have to take all of that into consideration when when determining the best materials to use okay um there's another hands in a minute so but i have yesterday i was driving and radio to jeremy vine i've got another hand somewhere i'll let you come back in, in a second i'm going before you i don't like you don't you don't get second chat if you're giving out you give it out but you come back in a minute radio two yesterday we're talking about potholes with 
Jeremy Vine. And there was a num loads of calls coming in. But coming out of that, what Councillor Holder said, one of the experts said, to get our roads up to standard, it would cost us an extra £10 billion a year nationally. That would take us 55 years to get our roads up to standard. So that is the position we're in. I, from a personal point of view, I think, yes, there is a, an element of climate change going on. It's getting warmer. We're getting warmer winters. Definitely wetter. And I've spoken to a couple of farmers in my parochial area, but I think in general terms, the water you're seeing running off of the fields into the roads is causing damage. Whether we can go back to talking to farmers in the future and say, I think in the past, it has been in the past, they, cut, they used to cut things. Whether we can speak to them and see if they can do something to help with the ditches to, to reduce the levels of water. And the other thing I find rather interesting, we've had a lot of snow plows, it's been lying redundant for the last number of years because we're not getting the snow that we get anymore. Now, whether it's a risk that we say, let's not invest so much in snow plows, but invest more in water tankers, gully tankers, because that would get the effect of clearing the drains out, because a lot of the drains are getting annual clearance, and it should be it should be more. So, you know, that would be a matter for the council to decide whether we want snow plows, because I think chipping them out a bit of rain, wouldn't snow once this year, one day, it was gone before the end of the day. Um, I think it's something we could consider, but um, that's only my views, but... I'm now going to let if you if you want to respond to any of that, but do you, do you think it's a possibility we can offload the snow plows and sell them off cheap and get some water tankers? Well, um, so um, uh, I remember um, a few years ago when I lived down in in Kent, uh, and there was a somebody phoned in to BBC News and said, "I hear there's a storm coming," and the weatherman I can't remember his name said, "Don't believe it, nothing's happening." And the storm I think it was Michael Fish, and then the storm came. So unless you were aligned to his his forecasting knowledge of the weather, Jerry, I think that's probably probably not going to happen. But joking aside, um, we do actually have a statutory responsibility as a local authority to plan, unfortunately, both for snow uh, and rain. So the opportunity to uh, offload our um, our snow plows is not there. However, however, I don't know whether this is feasible, and maybe the office can have a look at it. Um, when you go around some of the big cities in, in the States, they don't have snow plows. They modify their waste vehicles, and they have a way of fixing on, on front of their waste vehicles, snow plows. Now, we are about to go through a major um, re-procurement exercise for our, our, our fleet, and Councillor Munns behind me will be looking very closely at the, the re-procurement of the 8,707 waste vehicles that we're going to need to. And it may well be that some of that technology that's been in the States for many years is available that we can procure in the UK. I don't know whether that's the case. I don't want to give them a hospital pass in the middle of a, in the middle of a select committee, but maybe it's something we could have a look at. Um, with regards to your comment about, about the gullies, um, we have actually... Um, uh, acquired a, an additional um, gully sucker, it's the best way to describe it, uh, and they are for specific use to be specifically requested by and used by the parish stewards. So I would urge your parish and town councils who have regular um, opportunity to influence what the parish stewards are doing to make use of that extra facility. And I would hope that by the extra facility being used, and it's part of Chris's team, I think, Chris Clark's team, is that we will actually be able to be a bit more preventative with the clearing of our gullies during, hopefully, the drier summer to prevent some of the issues that are going to happen in the, in the wet winter. And that, that is there. And as far as I'm aware, I haven't seen huge amounts of extra demand for that services from the parish stewards. So I would urge you to go out through your LH figs in your parishes to make sure that that is being used five days a week, seven hours a day, and going around and doing the routine maintenance that is so important. Yeah, I'll just add in the, the, the discretionary gully services, we call it, um, is available to parish councils to task. Um, they have been written to in the last six weeks, the parish clerks, setting out the process for that. So I, I would commend it as a service that uh, is something that should be made more use of. Uh, I'm going to let Councillor Jackie Lee come in, just hear one more question, and then Mr Councillor Palmer, you can... How do I do one question? 
Um, going back to you know this communication, um, certainly being parochial. In my patch, you've done a resurfacing of um, a particular road, restaurant, great. And my residents are jumping up and down saying, you've spent all this money resurfacing and all the the um, bits on the top, I can't think what they're called, gravel, whatever, are all disappearing. And I think this is where it's important that we communicate that whether that gravel is supposed to be there or whether it is supposed to eventually wear off. Because all we do is we end up with dissatisfied customers thinking that um, we've not done a proper job. Um, and of course, the other issue, if I can bring this in, is our utility companies who are not repairing in a timely manner, i.e. water companies, and those are damaging our roads um, with their leaks, and they're not repairing the, the damage that's also caused. So it's going back to the communication because i know from my contacts um in road closures that you have regular meetings with utility companies um where you do haul them over the coal and i think that put out to our public so that they know that that's what we're doing um is important because then they understand that we're not just sitting back and letting it happen okay so Thank you. Um, take the point in terms of communication, absolutely, in terms of the work that's been undertaken on the network and the expectations in terms of performance, particularly around, um, I'm aware of that specific location. In terms of network permitting and the utility work, I would say the team are working incredibly hard to hold those utility companies to account. It is resource intensive at the moment, but I probably just signpost you, we've touched on it in the main report, but signposted you to the uh, year three report in terms of the permitting scheme. It is available on the website and you can see the process which we're there to um, make sure those reinstatements are fit for purpose and the time frame within which we uh, expect them to do that and as you say we do call them in when they're not performing um, appropriately and there are further lines of enforcement should we need to take it but at this moment in time we are content that the conversations are delivering improved outcomes but we monitor that very closely. Mr Palman. Sorry I'm going to get slightly parochial on the, on the gullies front. Um, our uh, parish council, our town council, um, asked all the the, the uh, uh, councillors in the area to, to to talk to highlight which gullies needed unblocking. I managed to get um, because there was going to be a gully uh, clearing exercise for a week in the, the coming weeks. We all provided a lot of information. We talked to all our residents. They were expecting to see that activity actually happen, and we've heard nothing since we provided that that input. So. We, we've had a kind of negative effect on our, our residents where that they were asked to, 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 to provide information. We've given that information, nothing, absolutely nothing's happened. So the idea that, that the gully, uh, that, that it's underutilized, so it doesn't seem to stack up with my experience. Tom. I'm sorry to hear that and what I would say is unfortunately a lot of our resource has been deployed as I said earlier in terms of an agile way to respond to um, storm hang. I will take specific action away but it goes to the point that Councillor Holder made earlier about the feedback loop and in making sure we're being clear open and honest and transparent about what is achievable within appropriate time scale uh, and then what is achievable in the medium and longer term so apologies for that. Councillor Bud is it just a question not a statement because I'm We've Chairman, I wanted to pick up on something which yep. you raised okay. and which I don't think has been addressed. I actually asked Perry Holmes whether there is in law any duty on landowners to prevent unnecessary and undue water runoff onto highways of the consequential damage on the highways. And I do think uh, whether we want to go down that road initially or not, I think officers should be asked to consider a strategy for addressing the issue of damage resulting from runoff from uh, surrounding or adjacent farmland. Thank you. I'm conscious, conscious this is a very complex uh, legal process around this, but what I would say in the first instance is that we have a lot of 
really positive landowners in Wiltshire who take their responsibilities very seriously. For those which are not taking their responsibilities seriously, the team are working very hard to challenge them and make sure they are undertaking their duties effectively. It's probably, um, with your approval, Chair, it's probably more appropriate if we come back with a detailed briefing note to, again, part of the communication strategy, making sure everyone is aware, including local residents, but actually um, this group is aware in terms of the activities we are already undertaking and next steps where those uh, landowners refuse to uh, fulfil their duties. Thank you for that. Did you want to come back on then when we were on? <laughs> Can I just come back on that one? I mean, that's a very interesting point because speaking of somebody who owns a garden, when the water runs out, it's got nowhere to run except out of my garden. And it's not my responsibility to act as a flood defence for um, the, the, on behalf of the council who've failed to provide adequate drains on the road. My garden borders the road. It feels the water comes down from the farmer behind. It comes through and it flows out. And I think legally, I cannot see the council has any right to um, do anything about it. That's a position I will take when I, I arrive get, at the magistrate's court. I don't, I don't want to give it. I don't want to give I don't want to give it tennis here. But this is your last serve. Uh, and I'm going to come of, on, Just to on. share information, Chairman. I put the question to Perry Holmes whether there was a, uh, a legal obligation uh, and whether there was any precedent for the council using it, and he came back with the answer simply in a chat very briefly he said yes and yes and i'll prepare a more detailed note and i think that's what uh the uh, the officer uh, samantha is saying and i think i look forward to receiving okay fine so that agenda item has been the most non-parochial one i've done for a long time <laughs> and that's a bit strange that because uh, i know highways is a motive and i know it's one of our big bugbears so right so this is a draft resolution that the select committee one, endorses the Highways Annual Review of Service and confirms that the performance of the Council's Highways contractors has been good during 2023. Two, that we welcome the additional funding provided by the Council for Highways activities in 2023. Three, we acknowledge, acknowledge the extensive programme of road resurfacing and highway maintenance being proposed for 2024-2025 and the additional funding being made available by the Council to help support this. And four, requests report on the highway service and the performance of the highways contractors in a year's time. Everybody happy with that? those proposals? Yes? Uh, do I have a second for that? Uh, okay, all in favour? Right, thank you, and thank you for that uh, very good report. Thank you, Nick, Sam and Nat, I think we've got to move to the next item, which is similarly, <laughs> Item 8, the update of the development of the My Wilts Potholes reporting functionality. I think we have Councillor Ashley O'Neill on this one. It's an update it's in your agenda pack 361 and 364 of your pack. And Ashley's uh, his, uh, job is the Cabinet Member for Governance, IT, Broadband, Licensing, Staffing, Communities and Area Boards. And he will in introduce this uh, item. All good? Okay. Thank you, Mr Chairman, and thank you for your welcome. Although I have to say the, the job title has slightly changed now. We've knocked the uh, communities and area boards off the end, and that is a responsibility now held by Councillor Ian blair Pilling. I think it's behind me. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to cover a couple of points uh, that I want to address. And before I hand over to Mark Tucker, who is our Director for IT, and Mark is going to take you through a slightly more detailed summary uh, and a presentation. But I think where I probably want to start is, uh, I think it's important to be completely honest and, and transparent about where we are at the moment with My Wilts. I think if we are honest, we're not where we want to be uh, with the My, My Wilts app. I think we, we recognize that. We're all aware of the issues. Lots of people are raising, uh, raising it to be quite regularly around sort of the problems that people are experiencing. And, a lot of those issues uh, are historical issues that are to do with decisions that were made uh, you know, a long time ago. Some of them are to do with governance issues around how various systems uh, integrate within the council, but they really boil down to 
sort of two overall um, issues. One is on the app side of things, so that's the application that people are using either on their smartphones or uh, on the computer and some of the functionality within that uh, not working, those are technical issues. And then on the other side of it, uh, issues in how the services are interacting with people through my world. So that's the actual you know, sort of the management of the cases themselves, the, the information that comes back uh, from a case, what the end users see, the issue around, uh, you know, your, your sort of your request has been closed, even though it might not necessarily have been completed. I think we've all heard those complaints. So none of these sort of things are, are new that I'm saying. But all that said, I think what's important now is that, that we look to the, to the future. We know where we are right now. We know things are not ideal. And so aside from some recent fixes to try and improve some of that communication uh, and some of those technical issues within the app, most of the work that we've been putting in uh, recently has been around developing a replacement app to address the issues that we've got. So you know, we are wholesale working on something that will replace the current iteration uh, of my Wilts. And the idea of that being that we will address not only the technical issues that we have in the current app, uh, but also the sort of the service, the way the service operates and integrates with the app and how they communicate with end users. That app is scheduled for release uh, in the summer of this year. I'm looking at Mark here because uh, I don't want to put um, Mark under any undue pressure, but I'm pushing very, very hard to make sure that, that, that we hit that deadline. I think I also probably want to just say that it's, it's easy to look at something like My Wilts and think, well, you know, this is easy, right? You know, anyone can develop an app. And what about all these wonderful commercial things that we've got out there in all the in the app stores, whether it's your, your Apple App Store or your, your uh, Android App Store? But actually, for a council, this, this sort of work is enormously complex. You can't just go out there and buy something off the shelf that integrates into all of your systems. Every single service area, and you know, think about how many services we have within the council, they've all got their line of business systems. And anything that you either bring in from third party or you develop in house has to try and integrate into all those different systems. There's nothing that you can just go and buy uh, off the shelf that is you know, gonna look wonderful and have all this functionality that just works out of the box. <laughs> We've had two goes at this previously, so we are on the second iteration uh, of My Wilts. It hasn't worked out to date. The first app that we had, for those of you that remember this, that were around at the time, uh, was, was actually written by a, a small organisation, a third party. That had its limitations and issues, and uh, it was a struggle to get that to work. And the most recent iteration uh, that we're on that has all the issues was actually developed and Mark, I'm sure you'll correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong here, by Microsoft. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and it still has uh, all of these issues. So I think that just sort of talks to the, you know, the scale of how difficult this is uh, to achieve, given that uh, you know, a small organisation can't get it right, and even a, a large one like Microsoft, when doing it on our behalf, also can't get it right. So this time we are doing things slightly differently. So what we actually have is a, a team of in-house developers that are working on this. The benefit of doing that is they understand in a lot more detail about the nuances of our own systems and, and what we need to do to make everything integrate much better. So it is a bit of a change um, of approach. I'm very hopeful, uh, given conversations that, that I've certainly had with officers, that the outcome that we get from that will be much better than we've had previously. There's a huge amount of work going on behind the scenes to work on that, that new release. Uh, I think it's, it's fair to say that I and officers certainly recognise how important it is to get this right. What we are determined to do is deliver an app that does meet expectations and takes away all of those current frustrations uh, that we've got, not only from an app perspective and the technical issues, but also that service to user communication through that platform. I'm going to hand over to Mark now if I can. Mr Chairman, I'm going to suggest that um, any questions, if we can just sort of wrap them up at the end rather than me... Uh, addressing any of them now. I think that might be a bit easier if that's okay with you. Thank you, Ashley. Uh, yes, as per the uh, ask from yourselves, I thought I'd give you just a little bit of an update on what we are doing with the current application. It's under maintenance with ourselves at the moment. When Microsoft finished developing it, um, they essentially handed us all of the code um, and somewhat left us to our own devices to look after it from that point forwards, uh, which we've been doing. 
uh, and there's a range of maintenance activities that we've taken uh, over the last few years and particularly recently to address some of the issues that have been raised by yourselves and members of the public. Uh, and I'll also give you a brief description of what we're doing in terms of the new application that Ashley referenced. Um, this is just a brief history. You've got it in the, in the pack and it really covers what um, Ashley said earlier. So we are currently on the second version of my wilts um, and will ultimately be producing a third version for release later this year. Um, some of the issues that we've had with the current my wilts are technical. Um, uh, in essence, interaction with uh, particularly smartphones, actually, uh, the web version by and large works for what it does uh, but providing a single app that works across a range of smartphone types is actually quite tricky um, and we've had to make a number of adjustments um, uh, to accommodate that uh, in fact it's worth saying there's actually three versions of the current my wilts there's the version you see on the web there is a version for apple phones and there is a version for android phones uh, and we obviously have to maintain all three in synchronization. Um, and the different platforms often have different technical issues, and we have to resolve those on a platform specific basis. We also, uh, the statistics tell us that the most frequent case types raised on my wilts are highways cases, unsurprisingly. Uh, and of those, potholes are the most frequent highways case type. In terms of the MyWilts application, for various reasons, historical reasons, the actual interface that members of the public see when they lodge uh, potholes cases actually isn't the MyWilts application. It isn't our code or Microsoft's code. Uh, Again, for, for reasons we've had to expose what in essence is Sam and the team's operational system. Um, that is not ideal. One, it looks different to the rest of my wilts, and I know that confuses a lot of people, um, and that's understandable. Um, it doesn't help when you have two looks and feels. It's also, although we use the same identity, and you might have heard us refer to Citizen ID, um, it, my wills cannot exchange the, this person has logged on and they are Fred Jones or whoever, um, to the uh, highways aspect. And so you get a second log on prompt. And I also know that that does annoy people considerably. Um, and we've seen a number of complaints about that, of course. Um, those elements we can't address, but elements where there are issues with maps, uh, where there are issues with photographs attaching and other things, we've essentially been addressing over time. The latest set of uh, adjustments that we've made are to do with the information that is sent back to residents when they actually log a case. So prior to Christmas, uh, when you log a case, in essence, you get the email from the system that tells you that the case has been logged. And then, uh, particularly if a case has either been actioned or it's been passed to another party uh, for corrective action, the resident gets a case closed. And it's not always clear. In fact, it's not clear why that case was closed. So what we've done in the current version is that we have now linked my wilts to the systems used by the highways team so that the commentary that is added by SAMS engineers who uh, examine the sites um, and the conclusions that they reach are passed back and be, can, can be included in the email that is sent to residents. That fix actually happened just before Christmas uh, we didn't make a big song or dance about it when we did it. We prefer to do these changes incrementally. As you know, this happens uh, uh, on applications these days. They update all of the time, um, and these incremental fixes essentially come through. Um, 
that has helped. It's not addressed all of the concerns because some of the things are down to how we use the application, both ourselves and our colleagues, highways in this case, but the other service areas for other app types. Um, and so we have the part of it is technology and part of it is behaviours. Uh, the one thing I will say is that we are now working very closely with our service teams and colleagues to ensure that we can fix what we can fix technologically and we can converse with them when it comes to uh, how the application is actually used by our service areas. Okay. Where we are now with the current application is we have put it into a maintenance mode where we are only doing critical updates, i.e. if something is broken or if we have something like a cybersecurity issue where we absolutely need to address that. Um, the bulk of my developer resources are now concentrating on the new application. It gives us a chance to correct the technical errors of the past. Uh, also, Ashley referred to the difficulty of, of having to connect to all the various uh, applications used by our service areas to provide their services. Um, we can, in essence, do that ourselves now. Um, it's our team, it's our code. We are beholden to no one um, in order to develop and support this system. Um, and we have the skills and knowledge in-house rather than relying on third parties to do that. So that's what we're doing now. And there is a whole project plan uh, which we've shared both with our cabinet member Ashley and is shared with our leadership um, to show the various works that we are doing in the development of that new application. OK. I think that'll do for the presentation. I'm happy for questions. Right. OK, then. Um... Before I start, hands are flying up here. So, would anyone from the select committee like to share their experience of an email response? Improvements instigated after the 14th of December. But you have got one coming today. So, I'm going to uh, Councillor Palman, number one, Councillor Walters, number two, and I'll start looking around. Yeah, thanks. Um, one thing that came to mind is, is the country is full of councils. And they must all be developing similar apps. Now, I think part of the qu my question will be answered that the back end is very different from council to council because everyone's got a, got different uh, systems to connect it to. But the front end, the the actual interface with uh, the, the customer, it, it, everyone must roughly want the same thing. It, aren't there other councils we could work with in parallel rather than having to to, to do it ourselves in isolation, so to speak? Uh, uh, yes, other councils are doing similar things. Um, as a unitary, we've got the largest number of service areas that a council can have, and therefore more back-end systems to link to. Um, what we've discovered today is that we're all at different areas of our development in terms of our digital offerings. Uh, you're quite right, we have different back-end systems. And that's where most of the complexity lies, in all honesty. Um, I won't say the front end is simple, but of all of the things that we do, that's the easier part. Um, and yeah, there aren't really any common libraries or common applications that have been developed to date. And from the conversations we've had, there hasn't really been a appetite uh, for uh, uh, an effort across councils. I'm not saying that's impossible, but where we all are, budgetary, technologically, etc. Oh, I just saw Andy come in a second. I was just going to add that. And so I think there isn't the appetite there really you know, across the sector uh, from, from what we can tell. And the technology base typically is so diverse. You think about the number of services that are in any one council and how many line of business system offerings that, that that particular service can take from in the market for their own specific service needs. And then you start to get an idea of just how many different technology providers are involved in this. And you know, I certainly wouldn't want to see us slow down our progress and, and delay anything through trying to sort of push that avenue any further. So I think it has been explored um, you know, in some respects. Yeah, 
but certainly sharing experience fine but i think we need to you know we need to get on and deliver this for us because it's, it's really important that we have a good offering andy you hold the purse strings <laughs> Uh, thanks, Chip. Just on, on that point, I mean, um, when we are going down this path, and it is a risk that um, we have to, the, to um, what, what I'm describing as a, as a technical fix in, in, in terms of this programme, but the, um, so when we looked at this, Mark was asked in terms of an options analysis, do we go outside and, and, and get someone in to do this for us? Uh, can we do this internally? Um, so we are doing this in, in term, internally, but um, uh, Mark has a team of developers, and we've got a high turnover with, within within those within that team. So there is a risk there that uh, those individuals that we are relying on to, to do everything that, that Mark has described about in terms of code and what other geekery that we, we, we are seeing here in terms of the product, but we are reliant on on those, those individuals. So. As we we've made the decision to go down this route uh, and to move to, to something called the progressive web app, we are reliant on those developers and retaining those developers to make sure that we can do the next iteration and, and still enhance what we've got. So there is a risk there for the for the council to to, uh, to to undertake that. But we did undertake an options analysis of saying, do we pay for a um, a, t a, a software developer to come in and, and do that for us? And we are beholden on them. We've got the experience where we've done that with with Microsoft, and we've been left with it. Um, but we are going down in the internal route. But that does come with the risks around the resourcing and the uh, capacity and capability to to do that. Okay. Do you want to respond? Yeah, then? yeah. Please make sure they comment their code really well, so that if somebody does take over, they can get into there. Because, but yeah, that's their IPR really, isn't it? Derek, case the waters. Thanks. Um, yes, thank you for that. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I spent uh, a number of years working for a global investment bank on, so I understand all those those issues that you're describing. Um, uh, would you expect your um, once you move forward into this, will you expect to still have three versions operating? Um, you know, one for each of the platforms. Are you expecting that? The answer is no. One of the reasons that we have decided to adopt the progressive web app technology, um, and that this technology is a industry standard, um, it's supported by a number of industry players, um, and it is more agnostic of the platform uh, that it lands on. It means that we can have one code base uh, instead of three code bases. Um, at least initially, there might be slight differences on how a resident installs it on their phone. PWA is installed in a slightly different way to App Store apps, uh, but we might be able to address that as well. Uh, that's going to be in, under investigation once we've got the first version out of the door. Um, but no, there's one code base. That's actually one of the things that we wanted to achieve, that we've got one thing to update and that it cascades through to all of the various platforms that are used. Uh, thank you. And just uh, uh, another question is basically the skill sets that you um, are employing, are they skill sets that uh, you can uh, utilise in other parts of the, um, of the, si the systems that we, that we have? So they're not specific for this particular task, they can be allocated to other tasks? Uh, actually, exactly that. Um, again, We've got a variety of uh, systems that we develop uh, within the council. Um, uh, you have no doubt seen a few of them, like the garden waste system, uh, etc. There's a whole range, actually, that we produce uh, behind the scenes. Uh, we are now using a single approach and the same or similar technology to do that, meaning that the skills of my developers can be applied to all of these. So we're attempting to minimise the differences, basically, so that we are able to uh, provide engineering and development resource in all of those different areas. So, yes. Uh, thank you. Just lastly, um, and those skill sets are, are commonly found outside. We're not running down a, um, you know, a, 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 an alley um, taking us away from, uh, you know, the, the common development platforms? Uh, yes, again, that's actually been one of our objectives, uh, that we're using 
fairly generic tooling um, that anybody that would develop and code for a modern web application would use. So developer skills are rare in the market anyway, um, but we're at least targeting where the bulk of them are rather than anything particularly specialist or niche. Um, so as much as we can do, the answer is yes. Okay, um, Councillor, Councillor Budden, then I'll take you, Councillor Williams. Thanks. I, I, um, uh, I, t I take the point about skill sets, and I think it's clearly a balanced judgment whether to go and buy outside or do it yourselves, and you've chosen to go down the road you have. I've got two questions, really. You made the point that actually the front end of the system is the easiest bit to build. Uh, I just share with you the observation from residents where I live who compare the functionality of my wilts with the app in adjacent counties and that the front end is very important. Are you learning not only from the experience of other councils in selecting a system but how their front ends work and devising one that will match or better than? And also, will there be an opportunity for us and for councillors to comment on the functionality before you finalise it. Because it's not only residents who are making the entries that want to see improved functionality, but councillors and parish councillors who want to be able to see, in some way, summaries of what's going on. I'll let um, Mark comment on sort of the learnings from other councils and their front ends. But, I mean, I certainly recognise that actually in delivering a new app. If we don't get the front end right, then it doesn't matter what the back end looks like and how good the interaction with the service is, then people, are, the perception is still going to be that we haven't delivered um, the objective. So um, Mark, and, uh, Mark and Andy know, know quite well my pleas to make sure that we are focusing very, very heavily on that front end. Uh, and we know the sort of the technical developers that sort of mainly do back end code are not always the best people to uh, to come up with a friendly user interface. So and I have made that point, we'll continue to do so uh, and we'll we'll make sure we try and address that. And, and just secondly, uh, to your um, point about members being able to uh, to feed back into this this process. Assuming we're able to hit our our target rollout of, of this summer, there is likely to be quite possibly, depending on some of the technical limitations, uh, a period of time where both apps will be able to be run side by side. It would certainly be my intention, if we can make it work, to offer an early release uh, to members mm -hmm. so that you know they can get on and start using it in earnest before we do a general release to the public. And what that will enable them to do is obviously give that early feedback. And if we can incorporate that into the, uh, you know, to the development process and make sure that we're early on addressing some of those concerns if they're starting to crop up uh, that would certainly I think be beneficial so I think that addresses your point point. and then Mark I don't know if you want to comment on the sort of learnings from other councils in, in terms of the front end uh, yes I mean obviously we have observed what others have done um, and have taken uh, what we believe to be good practice and applied it to the new design I'd also say that um, so the colleagues and my staff that are involved in developing the new website, uh, which you've seen uh, the front page and the subsequent uh, new pages, we've developed a design language there. Uh, you've seen it with the larger buttons um, uh, and, and the other elements. Um, we are carrying as much of that that is sensible into the new version of my Wilts. So on a large screen, they would look very similar indeed. On a smartphone, it obviously adapts to the size of the screen and it changes um, actually a reasonable amount to adapt. Um, but yeah, the idea is that we are making it, uh, let's say less engineer-like in appearance and somewhat more of the type of thing you would expect to see on a smartphone device. The reason I mention smartphones specifically as well is that we can tell from our traffic analysis that the majority of cases raised on my wills are raised on smartphones rather than people sitting on a laptop or a desktop machine. OK, 
Mr. Williams. Thank you, and thank you. I know I'm not a member of the committee, but I'd just like to make an observation on whilst I'm here, uh, and that was all clarity. Is you talk about getting rid of three separate sort of platforms and having one, but will the public and myself and everybody just be able to download that from the App Store? Or what, because he used a term which I wasn't familiar with to access it. That's actually something we need to decide in terms of the first drop. So a progressive web app is a website at the end of the day. It's a clever website, uh, but in essence is a website. Both Android and Apple have ways of installing it as an app on their devices, but it's not via app stores. Now, one thing we are talking about in terms of technology is that it is possible to put what's called a wrapper around one of these type of applications so that you can install it via the app stores. And we are considering whether that ought to be part of a release, maybe even the first release to the public, to be decided. But that is an option for us. I personally would urge you to do that because I think it, anything we can make it easy to do, um, everybody's familiar to go to an app store, download it from the app store, it's on your smartphone. Um, if, there's any, if you're going to do it other ways, like by an email, HTTP, whatever you call these things, then people aren't going to read it. They don't read the emails, they go in the junk box and you, people just switch off. So I, I urge you on behalf, your behalf, if you might, Mr. Chairman, to say it's got to be through an app store. Everybody's familiar with it. And the other thing is, at the moment, on the current ones, and I've got the page open here, Pothole needs pop-ups enabled. Pavement or curbs need pop-ups enabled. I'm getting residents not using the app at the moment because they don't want to enable pop-ups because they think it refers to adverts. And I keep saying, no, it's not. It's so you can get, I believe, into the maps and things like that. That's, but they think it's pop-ups, it's adverts. So can we, you need to just, I'm just telling you that as a, because they say, I'm not going to use it anymore. If you want to report it, Williams, you do it. That's it. No. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Any other questions? I think, uh, Ian. It's not a question. I'd just like to point out I've had an alert on my phone. Polish the snow plows because there's snow forecast for Easter for five, inch, five inches in the southwest. <laughs> just trying to whittle on my fireworks, aren't you? Okay. Any other questions? No? Okay. So we'll move to the recommendations. Um, and the, the one, we note the improvements made to the MyWilts application to provide more information to the public when a case is closed. Two, notes the roadmap for the planned improvements to the MyWilts application moving forward. And three, receives an update report after the release of the new MyWilts system in this year, 24, because we want to know it. So uh, as, as soon as it's ready to go, so we can see how we're going and where, where it's going. Okay, thank you then for you three for showing up. And uh, sorry. Oh, I just remembered something. <laughs> All um, I propose that from the chair. Do we want to vote on that? <laughs> just move. Thank you, Simon. Yeah. So I just say thank you very much. Okay, so um, I propose to the chair. Have I got a second there for that? <laughs> yeah. All in favour. Right, okay, just just a minor, minor thing, really. That's okay, not to worry. Thank you, thank you for attending. Yeah. Uh, I recently used the Swindon app to report a pothole, and they turned around and said, it's not us, you need to contact Perton Parish Council and gave a phone number. And I thought that was interesting how they um, deflect the issues back to a parish. There's a lot of deflection goes on in a lot of things. Give people a chance to move into position. Yeah. Right, well, we just move before we move on to nine, yeah? Uh, just very briefly, I'd just like to say that Jerry is actually making the odd, um, how should I say, the odd error in order to train me, I think. So <laughs> I, now, I now know what not to do. So thank you, Jerry. It's okay. <laughs> right. Right then. Um, we're going to move to number nine now, um, the library's development, uh, pages 365 to 372 of your agenda pack. We have Councillor Ian Blair-Pilling, I'm not going to say what his cabinet role is because it's probably been changed again since 
we've had this print and um, we have some other people with us. So, Ian, welcome. Um, thank you so much, Chair. Um, but I think we come to slightly lighter relief in your afternoon, um, or, or should I say gentler section of the afternoon. Um, just for the record, then, my responsibility is as of last Friday, our public health, um, communities, leisure and libraries, which I happen to think is particularly good set and fit. Um, I, I would like to just give one intro to the next two items, uh, because I think they all lie in the same context in this. It, it, and that is that, for, for example, uh, and to go back on what I mean by putting some context in there, is that you are specifically about peer review and uh, where are we on the strategy for libraries. But I would like you to um, think about this and focus your questions and, I hope, suggestions in a slightly wider context than that, on, on both this and the leisure. Because what we've been doing in the last two to three years is, is focusing on the essential raison d'etre and the wise and red, wise, wider raison d'etre of both leisure and libraries. And I would summarise the headings within that to you as firstly, financial sustainability. Uh, and within that, I make a point that I mean net, not just within their individual budgets. Uh, therefore, we consider what is the cost of the buildings and the running of them in, in the same context, although they actually lie in a separate budget in that. Um, and in that, recognizing that leisure is essentially non-statutory. Library has a statutory element, but not everything we do in libraries could be said to be a statutory responsibility. And therefore, the, the so what from that is, so why are you doing it? What's the justification? And, and that's what I want to come to the, the next few points. And so we consider the justification comes under three headings. And that is the contribution to health and well-being of our communities that both leisure and libraries make, the contribution they make to communities. And I would ask you to think about communities in every single sense of the word in that. So not just thinking area boards and geographical areas. Um, and then finally, the local economy. Probably not a principal driver, but we, we do think about it in in that. And then there's a final prism to look at all of this through, and that's uh, environmental sustainability. Because within that, we're all part of the target of getting to 2030 and being carbon neutral. I would make as a, a wider comment that uh, leisure and libraries, we're doing pretty well in that. Um, so, and then when talking about the contribution, I would ask you please to think about not just the contribution directly that you think a leisure center makes or a library makes, but what do the, what contribution are they making to the wider council business plan? What is it they're doing in support of other services? Um, and in particular, we've we've majored quite a lot on public health in that, and increasingly you will see us uh, focusing on children's services, adult care, what is it we do in those leisure centres and libraries and the wider organisation of them that contributes and helps? Otherwise, we don't deserve to exist in this. Um, the final point I'd like to make is, this is us in front of you at your request, for you to put your questions to us. My, my request to you, please, is, is please make suggestions to us as well as questions. Um, you all got brains, you all know what could be better. And don't restrain the, those suggestions to just what you put to us here and now. Um, every library, every leisure center has a manager or somebody there, they would like to be interacting with the public. So often I get something that comes through cabinet level to me that could have been put to the leisure centre manager, or could have been dealt with there and then, 
could and and so more and more we want to be establishing that local relationship making it positive in this um and then beyond that please feel free to go to david or rebecca who's not here today uh we have a very able substitute claire dow is going to present on on libraries so i've, I've probably given enough intro i'll let them do their presentation who's going to go first Oh, well, it's going to be me in the main, actually, Ian. Uh, if there are any tricky questions, I might hand them to Claire, but uh, I'm sure I can uh, I can shoulder most of them. Uh, thanks to the committee again for inviting us back. It's 12 months on since we were last here, and uh, we're just going to take you through, uh, as Ian's already suggested, some of the asks of the committee last time. So I'm going to ask Claire to uh, to share a presentation that I think you've all got on your packs. Do we need to connect to this technology? Yes. Can we ask those ICT people to come back? You think? <laughs> have they have they gone down the corridor now? Preparation is everything, David. Jumping in. Definitely our HDMI. It's coming in. I'm going to do a workaround. Can you just take that yeah. and do it up there? Have you not got the presentation now? Ellen's got it. I think she's got it in control, yeah. So, Claire, I've just sent you a link to the Teams meeting. Okay, I'm going back to share your screen and then we can speak up. I've joined, but um, it must be a slightly different one. Bear with me. Oh. Fabulous libraries are in the interim. <laughs> Best laid plans and all that. Yeah, I have to say, I think Ian's already alluded to it, but um, it is a bit of, and, and you know, it's, it's good to, uh, to talk to you about the good news that we're about to talk to you about, but just to reiterate, we only achieve this if uh, we're fully collaborative, which, is, which means engaging every uh, possible person in uh, giving us ideas about what we're getting right and perhaps not so right, more importantly. Here we go. We have it. Brilliant. Just out of, whilst, whilst we get the presentation up, um, just a show of hands, users of our libraries and leisure service, Ah, that's good. I'll separate them out. That's good. <laughs> oh, we need to. We can work on those, though, and that's a positive too. So, um, what you can see there. Ah, here we go. Okay. So here's the library stats. Thanks for uh, thanks for bearing with. Um, we talk about as a service all the time. There there are loads of uh, lots of data that that we that we sift through. Um, but I think I, I always say to the teams, um, it is really important to keep it nice and simple. And so the major, what you're seeing in front of you is, is the major measures of the service, which are the book issues and the visits to our libraries. And what we've got there is two comparators. We've got the comparator uh, from last year to this, and then we've got the comparator from pre-COVID to now. Now, uh, what you can see is, is uh, we are progressing in, in, in exactly the direction we want to be. We know that issues are up from last year. We know that visits are up immensely from last year. Perhaps uh, we're absolutely delighted that from an issues perspective, we're past our pre-COVID levels and boy, did they take a hit. So it's taken us a while to get there. Quite an achievement by the service. I could almost hear the ripple of cheers go around the county when we got past those pre-COVID issues. Visits as yet to our libraries, not where we'd like them to be. 20% down, but we have a plan. We have a plan. Um, and I'll go through some of the things that we're about to embark on in the next few slides. And are embarking on indeed, because 
part of what our library service is all about, and Ian's alluded to it in some way already, is uh, delivering the council's wider priorities. So you can see there, uh, we're registered. Every single li library is registered as a warm space. And um, our frontline staff, they've received all sorts of training to support our residents who come in and use it that way. 683 warm packs have been administered this winter. Think about that, 683 residents that we've given those types, and you can see the types of things that, that, that are in there. And in addition to that, uh, radiator reflectors uh, and panels, heated throws have also been offered to those to those most in need. And on the same agenda in terms of supporting our most vulnerable residents, uh, from April last year to February this, we've delivered an amazing 5,367 either low or no cost events and activities across our 30 different libraries. And that's to an 104,000 adults and children across the piste. No mean feat. Now, that will continue to move forward. And in terms of the measure of visits, um, we are moving in the right direction from that perspective. Our cabinet member himself can testify for the next one in terms of health awareness. He's uh, sporting the watch that he's actually purchased now after borrowing one from one of the four libraries that were administering blood pressure kits and tracker watches. That has been quite a success uh, for, from, from a resident's perspective. And I'm going to check with Claire. Have we, have we actually launched them at another eight libraries yet? Or are we about to launch we, them at we another? We have. We've now launched them in a further eight libraries. Fantastic. Fantastic. So, uh, again, a really another good kind of practical initiative that we're working on and we hope to reach out to even even more libraries and as you can see there um allied to that uh, there's the provision of the reading well self-help titles supporting um those in terms of long-term health conditions in particularly with regard to dementia and mental health issues which unfortunately are on the rise out there in our communities. Uh, there's a new dementia list that is launching in May 2024, and the service will be working, and Ian alluded to this already, and we do, we're do we doing this more and more throughout our library and leisure services. Uh, we'll be working with colleagues in adult social care to link the provision to the council's dementia strategy, something that I'm sure you consider to be very important. Thanks, Claire. I think we just got, we went on one too many slides there. I think I don't want to miss, I don't want to do you a disservice as a service. Um, uh, one thing that we're very important, uh, very excited about is next month, in fact, less than two weeks away, a lot of hard work has gone into um, uh, integrating not only the libraries, but leisure centres, but in the main libraries to become part of the new uh, community spoke model is the way it's been put for the family hub model. So this is early help for families. Uh, the contract you'll probably be aware has been won by Spurgeons, but those Spurgeons staff will be operating now from our libraries. Uh, there will be no um, vast amounts of buildings out there in communities causing additional extra costs to the authority. This will be integrated within our library service. Um, hosting health, health visitors as well as part of that. To be quite honest, we've been quite shocked at the amount of services that have followed the Family Hub services. And you can see a, 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 a selection of them there, the breastfeeding support groups and the local navigators. Um, and library staff, again, I've talked about training for frontline library staff. Again, a very flexible workforce is receiving further training to support this initiative. And uh, 
last but by no means least, uh, uh, there's the uh, the best start in life, uh, which is uh, we took the brave step in July last year of removing fines for children. Uh, we felt that this was a barrier. We're not the first local authority to do it. Some have already taken a lead. It's always kind of when we're cash strapped as a local authority, uh, but I think it's well documented that we're managing finances correctly uh, as a local authority. And this enables us to do things like what we've done here, which is remove those fines and some of the barriers that that creates for our children being more literate and borrowing the books from our services. And uh, uh, the, uh, to complement that, the year-round reading scheme, Story Adventures Club, that launched in, in autumn last year. And uh, we're trying to hit that 14 to, uh, 4 to 16 age group in terms of uh, all the educational benefits that, that come with literacy, as, as I'm sure um, is well documented. If anybody does want to have a look more in depth in that, there is a link there that, that, you, that, you, can, uh, that you can tap into. At your uh, at your own leisure. So Ian Ian talked about this. Uh, we've long wanted a library strategy. In fact, I don't think we've. Yeah, yeah. I, do, I don't think we've ever we've ever had a library strategy. Um, but when we were considering the library strategy, the first thing that we wanted to do was allow the LGA in and our arts and culture colleagues to review how we were currently operating. So bear all, it's kind of a, it's a bit of a scary step to be quite honest on the planning to this. Uh, outsiders are coming in to have a look at us. We've done it several times, you know, we had the corporate peer challenge. Uh, this was the first uh, for the authority that was completely online, a two day process last year and last July. Lots of nerves and trepidation building up to it, but I think when we got to the other side of it, uh, th these are some of the things uh, that I just wanted to share with you that the, the Peer Challenge uh, told us as, as a library service. It talked about Wiltshire Library Service um, has strong foundations, which we were relieved about, um, that obviously if we're going to build anything and build a strategy, building it on good foundations was absolutely essential. So it, it kind of confirmed that. Um, and both employees and the vast amount of volunteers that help support our library service, of which our cabinet member is one, but I, I'll skirt quickly over that, uh, are an asset to the service with partners, customers, and other council services recognizing them for their flexibility and inclusivity which I am very proud of the results that, that were find, found there, describing them as adaptable, having a can-do attitude and welcoming. They are loved and valued, which is really, really good to hear. Uh, the workforce will be a key asset uh, in terms of uh, taking the library service forward and looking at innovative ways of working. And lastly, Libraries are seen as non-judgmental safe spaces for our residents uh, that support a range, of, uh, a range of groups, many of whom are unfortunately vulnerable and need that support. And that was confirmed as part of that process. So here were the recommendations for the report and here were the approaches that we are and intend to take. Uh, we uh, take learning from the Peer Challenge as a starting point to develop the vision and purpose of the library service using a co-productive approach. So what have we done then? So um, we develop and deliver this library strategy that we're now building using community conversations approach to ensure the voice of our residents is reflected in in the future provision. So we're not saying as officers, this is a library service, this is how you do it and impose it on our, our, our communities. It's asking our communities what they want from their library service and how we can uh, develop and adapt that to suit. Um, we were asked to define the purposes and requirements of the library delivery through examples of uh, existing good practice, example, co-location, community buildings, mobile libraries, and virtual spaces. 
So uh, the, strategy, the strategy that we're developing now will ensure that the estate is, is fit for purpose. Uh, we've got 30 libraries across the county, and um, that's no mean feat. Uh, and that it meets our environmental requirements. Ian talked about the prism of, of, uh, of that uh, particular aspect, and that's one that we'll have to take particular consideration for when, uh, as we are developing the, the strategy. To ensure the value and purpose of the library is clearly stated, it is library first and foremo foremost that delivers the community support, information and signposting. So we're going to continue to promote, promote and improve on access to reading, information, digital support, community spaces and cultural activities for all ages. When all said and done, yeah, we are going to co-produce what uh, communities need from us as a library service, but we need to pay attention to what the original aspects of the library service were there to deliver to. So we mustn't forget that. And at all levels of the organisation, it is our aspiration, and it was good to hear the peer review team, the peer challenge team, tell us that we should be thinking library first in all, aspire, in our, in all aspects, when considering services contribute to the council's business plan and to be quite honest <laughs> i think we're getting that already because our doors <laughs> are being battered down claire will uh, testify for services that want to work with us and use our library services for their greater good too it's managing expectations a little bit at this moment in time so we are involving all council departments and we are ensuring wherever there are synergies that the strategy will make sure that we're, uh, we're, we're taking heed of them. Thanks, Claire. Is that uh, your report? Any, any no, there's, there's a little bit more. Apologies. No, so, fine, Chair. Getting conscious of the time, we've got two minutes left. <laughs> well, it's going to go past oh. <laughs> Sorry, Claire. Um, I We've got a ad lib, David. We've got a bit of a block. We've got a bit of a block. I, I tell you what I wanted to do. I think we'll probably come out of there, but um, yeah. The next slide was a bit about you know where we've come thus far with regard to developing the strategy and what we intend to do next. But you've all got that in your packs. And what I would ask you to pay attention to is some. We like to, and we share these on a regular basis now some of the anecdotes that come through from our residents that are really, really powerful. I'm not going to read them out now, but I would say that, you know, if you get chance, just look at what the library service means to our residents by having a read of those quotes. Right, we'll move on to the leisure one now, Claire, if that's okay, all right. No problem. Uh, before we do that, can I take, can I do do the take questions here? Can I take the questions on the libraries, I think, and then we can... Because there is like, and, and congratulations on 30 libraries being opened in a rural area because some of the urban areas have got less, far less than that in proportion to population. So, you know, you're working as a great team and it's good to see you. And I've now, I'm going to start with Jackie and then I'll come to Mel. Well, I've got lots of questions. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I'm aware because obviously Purton's got a library and the actual building belongs to Purton. And it's a very old building with a beautiful rounded window which is not going to be at all carbon neutral so i just wondered how we how we're dealing with the rented libraries that we might be having as to how we deal with the carbon neutral aspect um, can i also say that the post office have extended their thanks for the use of the wooden bassett library for the mo uh, the temporary banking hub which was absolutely brilliant. And yesterday we did the formal opening of the banking hub in the high street. Um, libraries obviously are very useful as information centers for our residents who don't have online access. And I think that that's the thing that we need to be pushing hard um, with, with um, our libraries. And I was really pleased to hear about Spurgeons because obviously again, Children Select, we know, know all about Spurgeons. But one of the things in, in um, we were picked up at Children Select is that we've got some issues with 
um, the standard of mathematics, reading phonics and, and that side of things is really good, which could be our library services are helping in that. But mathematics is the other aspect. So libraries, I know, is reading, but mathematics is reading. So I don't know whether there's any work that could be done where we can help with mathematics with children. Um, and I think that probably this report ought to go to Children's Select as well, even if it's just as a, a briefing so that Children's Select Committee know all about what you're doing. Oh, lastly, who knitted your hats, scarves and gloves? Because I have knitting ladies who would like to know because they'd like to knit you some more. So would you like to nitpick your way through those answers? <laughs> Let, let me start, if I may. Firstly, on the on the rented accommodation, I, I would beware of, of thinking of, of libraries. What are we going to do with this one, this one, this one, this one? The, when I came to this job, there was a savings measure to close all those small libraries. I have given that, or we have given that, a very big swerve, and said, no, no, look at us net. If you've got savings to make, if, we, if we've got uh, targets to achieve, we'll achieve them net across the whole set. And, for example, two, two of those uh, smaller libraries, we've managed to find another alternative. And they were straight off the top of the list, the ones that were costing us the most, in fact, in Market Lavingdon and Durrington. And, and so that's bought us some time and space in that. We will have to address what we do in terms of the environmental impact and the, and the costs, etc., in those small libraries. But I'm personally not going to be driven by saying, right, you've got to peel them off from the bottom and, and so on. We, we will be driven by achieving an overall target. And if there's one of those, you know, isn't carbon neutral in itself, well, you know, there'll be a compensation somewhere else in this. I'm not, I'm not going to be driven to be salami slicing off the library service so to speak and the more as you've seen in all of those things we develop the more important that totality of the library service is to the totality of the the um, council's business plan and i would urge you to not don't just think of 30 libraries either we have a home delivery service we we work in the prison we have the three mobile libraries they're all part of the overall equation in this. Um, on your digital access, yes, okay, point taken. Um, on maths, we'll take it away and 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 think and and think about it. I, I always have a, a point about education. I, I'm frustrated in in how much the schools seem to emphasize only English and maths. I think there's so much more to education. So I'm kind of slightly disappointed to, you know, that you pick out maths, so to speak. But but we'll we'll Take it away. Ian, can I come in? Yeah, go on. We can't possibly update the cabinet member about anything, everything. So it's you know there's that much going off, and and that's partly my fault. But there is an uh, uh, um, an initiative called Multiply, uh, and it's it's exactly that. It's about numeracy um, as opposed to literacy that the library service is more you know known for. But uh, Claire, do you just wish to just talk to us about? how many of our libraries are actually running Multiply and a little bit about what the scheme's about? Yeah, um, all of our library managers are involved with the delivery of the Multiply programme and we have Multiply champions in our library branches. So our staffed ones, obviously not our volunteer-led ones, we haven't quite got that far, um, but it's part of the three-year Multiply programme. We have an employed Multiply officer called Nicola Crompton who also works in terms of developing almost maths by stealth through um, our library stock. Um, I think that's what libraries are so wonderful at doing, helping people improve and self-improve throughout their lives from cradle to grave, their skills. You come into a library, you might now experience, because we've got multiply going on, a rhyme time that has more of a numeracy focus. Um, we have trained staff um, who are our multiply champions who engage with trying to have those stealthy conversations about maths and maths improvements so that we can 
try and get in at the lowest level before signposting someone to an official course and we know that many females in particular have grown up with um, a feeling that they shouldn't maybe be good at maths and that transfers when often they're raising their children in the future so um, we're doing all we can to influence good maths outcomes by having an involvement with that project and it's a project that runs throughout um, the council so yeah super proud of that sorry Ian. Any more? Have we, have we rounded off your... Okay, Jackie. Right, thank you. Yep. Mel. Thank you. Um, just a couple of different things. So I think, firstly, um, I'm, it's great that we've got a commitment to libraries, and thank goodness for that, because I think the libraries are hugely important. I work in a school, and I know we get the children involved coming along to join the library and all of those kind of things, and many of the many things that you've mentioned. So thank you for that. I think um, the important thing about reading is that it helps you access maths so if you can't read you can't read the maths question so i think the learning to read helps you with your maths so that's another way that but i think i take your point about english and maths shouldn't dominate everything and coming to a lovely library helps you just be excited about learning um i think my second point was about making sure that we join up with other departments so that there's always a bus route that runs past a library so families who find it difficult to access things can get to the library um, and if those are the bus routes that remain, then, then you know, I, it might be the case already. I'm just saying that we need to join up that thinking. Um, and so just to make sure people can get to the libraries is really important because it's our disadvantaged families that sometimes struggle and need, don't have books at home and all of those things. And my last thing was a suggestion, and I'm glad you wanted a suggestion, was have, are you familiar with and have you considered the Library of Things? Um, where families can um, share and join equipment so people have, have got stuff that they can't afford to buy. And that was just, that would make our libraries even more useful to our communities and be environmentally friendly. You go on the last one, I want to go on the first bit. Okay, Library of Things, yes, certainly an initiative that we see throughout the country. Um, we have a limitation in our library buildings for how much storage we've actually got back of house due to the fact that we're working really hard to keep that front public facing um, space um, in our provision. We do have initiatives running like repair cafes running up in Malmesbury Library and things So where we can bring the community in. It might be that we can store or get involved with the library things in a different way, working with other community partners, but we're absolutely open to all those sorts of suggestions. We want the communities to help shape their libraries and really hoping the library strategy through trying to engage with our non-users as well as our classic users informs us better to build a strategy for the future that is future-proofed. Brilliant. Ian, can I just come in and then leave the last word yeah, for sure. you? Is that sure, right? sure. Yeah. I just want to explain to you and describe to you a little bit about the connectivity that um, our place team is trying to foster at the minute, Councillor Jacobs, because it's directly in, in relation to your point about it seems obvious, doesn't it, that a bus route and a bus stop ought to be outside a leisure centre or a library, but it's not the case. But now we sit in our place team, the level of connectivity when we talk about our public transport strategies and being able to feed into that with our leisure and library strategies, I'm not saying it's going to be perfect. I don't think any of us would sit out around here and expect perfection but it's much more joined up and moving in the right direction with respect to that. So we've just been talking about it recently, actually. So, yeah, hopefully that helps a little. I can only add a couple of examples to that. For example, one of the major factors in why we cited, why we are citing the new Trowbridge Leisure Centre there is because of its proximity to the um, transport routes and the accessibility of those transport routes to people who live in areas of deprivation. We could have plunked it in an area of deprivation, but that wouldn't have helped the people in the other areas. Uh, there's another point there in that, for example, if you were at Cabinet yesterday, or watching Cabinet yesterday, we had the, the presentation on community conversation that was centred on um, the area, sorry, it's gone right out of my brain uh, in, on, uh, in Salisbury, that um, it, it's, it, sorry, Bermerton Heath. Heath. 
And and the problem is there, you can have the swim, you know, the best library you like in the middle of Salisbury. That doesn't help the mother with three children and a pushchair in, Bem in the middle of Bemerton Heath. So we've got to look at outreach solutions for these things, and that's what we're looking at. We don't have a magic wand in it. Um, you, you can't just um, go, right, we're going to move the libraries, we're going to move the leisure centres where they're best they are. We can only apply this as and when there is an opportunity. Uh, and I would highlight the opportunity that happened in Milksham was what do we do with the library and the leisure centre? I was there a week ago and it's absolutely buzzing. There are now three times the membership, library membership, in that, in the, in, with it in that leisure centre than, they, than it was in the high street, not that many yards, yards away. So uh, there's all parts of ingredients to getting this right, but we're absolutely mindful of the point you make. Coach Lou McLennan, then I'll come to you, Richard. Yeah, uh, I'm up in Scotland as much as I'm down here nowadays, and I was in the library in Denny, just outside Stirling, because it was easy to get to. And I, I, that was my first visit. Nice, nice library. And as I was going to the entrance, there's, a, there's a, like a room that's part of the library, and it was full of people knitting. And uh, then as I got into the doorway, there was a whole list of all the activities that were going on. And it's all come out of this, you know, keep warm in the winter and all the rest of it. Uh, and then it spawned all of these groups. So you don't just come in and keep warm. You actually come in and do something where you keep warm. And they're all knitting away and chatting. And, and I was like, I was like, you could see them all going on about it. And then there were book clubs and other things, you know, different activities. So I think that that's a, probably a, a new use we've never really thought of as libraries before. <laughs> we, you know, before a warm space, it was a place you went to to do the things that libraries did, like books, you know, and CDs and Video. Do you still do CDs and videos? Yeah. Videos. <laughs> no. <laughs> but um, the one last thing is, yeah, this um, hat, gloves, and uh, scarf. Do you do them in claret and blue? Yeah. <laughs> uh, just to come back to K Councillor McClellan, there. Um, it's interesting this because what we've been on, oh, we go on these journeys, <laughs> um, but you know, just opening our libraries up to warm and safe places is not enough sometimes because some of our residents that's a barrier they don't want to be seen as being vulnerable um so what we have been what i think we've been quite clever at is putting on these activities like what you're suggesting so people can it's the activity that and and they come in for that warm safe space um but that's really interesting yeah and uh, no it'll be totally red the hat and scarf sorry they only need hats up there because they're near the North Pole. It's colder. Um, Councillor, Bu Councillor Budden. Great presentation, thank you, and very positive, which is good to see. I didn't, uh, did I miss something? Your opening slide says, oh, uh, following the opening slide, you talked about how you'd worked hard to get people back into the libraries. But the opening slide says that compared with pre-COVID, issues are up by more than 10%, but visits are down by 20%. Now, there's a, there's, that's counterintuitive. And I didn't hear you expound that. I mean, are people just borrowing many more books? Is that, I mean, is it as simple as that? Or is there some more subtle explanation that I've missed? Um, no, what we've seen nationally, there's a change in visiting habits for people. Just as we're seeing there's a change to footfall to the high street, there's a change in footfall in the number of visits that people make out. Again, could be linked to the cost of living. People make less journeys in their cars to come somewhere. However, they're borrowing just as many items. Also, there's a rise in our e-book borrowing as well. So one thing that we want to explore going forward is actually... Are those new users? Are they users who also use us physically? Or actually, would those people have previously visited a library and now aren't coming now aren't coming out? So visits are physical people who come through the doors, who may not be, who could be attending for one of the wonderful activities we've just spoken about, or equally um, could be there to use our public computers or our Wi-Fi or digital provision. So issues are just one measure 
of um, you know the value. That's why visits are so so important for us that people are coming in. But the fact those those issues are rising pre pandemic every year, the issues were falling. So something's improving. <laughs> I just just to add to that as well, what I would like to say, Claire, is we've been quite successful in grabbing a little bit more money for our book fund. And we've got an absolutely fantastic. She she loves the science of book buying and how it's used and translating that into driving as many books being borrowed as possible. So we've grabbed about an extra 60, 70 K to uh, last year's budget and continue to do that moving on. And she's turning that little bit into a lot in terms of issues. And, and like Claire says, it does appear counterintuitive, but I think it's the switch to eBooks that's helping with that as well. But we do want footfall for all kinds of reasons that Ian suggested as well. It helps with well-being, people walking into town centres, helps people spending town centres on other things as well. Um, all those things that are, are good about getting to the town centre as well. So it's a, it, it's. Moving forwards, our strategy will try and address that balance and changes in public behaviour. Okay, so I've got to the recommendations. Um, so that uh, one, we're going to note the presentation. Two, we'll note uh, the results of the LGA peer challenge. Three, notes progress on the library strategy and the request a further update in due course. Do I have a proposal for that, please? Thank you, Mel. And seconder, Horace. Uh, oh, Horace, you can't. Uh, thank you, Ian. All in favour? Great. Thank you very much. That's a great report. And Claire, well done. Well done. It's very. Thank you. Thank you for your support. You, you know, you're giving people that, you know, up and down, upper echelons of life and that something good to work on. Uh, now we're going to come to the leisure uh, services update. Oh. Oh, I thought I'd put that on. So, as you can see, we were asked to present a picture um, from post-COVID and also uh, the um, insourcing. You'll remember that uh, we insourced 10 facilities that were run by an external operator uh, and we uh, now run those alongside and fully integrated as part of our entire leisure operations estate. So in, in, in effect, we've gone from 10 to 20 facilities. And Ian's already touched on it. Uh, uh, sustainability is our main drive here. So you can see very simply, uh, April to December 21, uh, we, it was costing us more than uh, we were taking in income. Uh, we start to, in the following year, uh, or the following comparison, uh, is is draw alongside and then as you can see now income is in excess of our expenditure so we're starting to eat into those other budgets thanks Claire uh, uh, positive news yet again what you're seeing here is from the point of uh, uh, insourcing uh, the 10 sites here is the growth in memberships and um, the second uh, graph is memberships included with our swim school as well. And yes, those, that, uh, those figures on the left-hand side are right. It's uh, multiple tens of thousands of, of, of fitness members and swim school members that we're dealing with here across the county. Thank you, Claire. Um, so here is kind of the comparisons between... Um, uh, uh, what we're calling here the transition sites, so the sites that we insourced, and the Wiltshire Council sites. Again, it's pretty much positive trends from transfer moving forward. There's not really anything going backwards, apart from the eagle eyes of you that will spot the swim school for the Wiltshire Council sites, 
has had a little bit of a blip and that's just some swimming teachers in one of our larger swim schools have decided they're going to set up their own private swim school in one of the military pools. And that's made a bit of a dint to our council numbers. Um, hindsight tells me it's a cold pool at Bulford Pool. They'll probably <laughs> come back when they realise how cold their kids are getting. But, um, you know, you have to shoulder these things. And um, th they're just some of, the, some of the facts and figures kind of translated. The overall growth is 31% in core memberships. I'm sure any private sector uh, company would enjoy that type of growth over the last uh, two and a half years. Uh, the numbers actually uh, in fitness members, they've gone, we went through the 20,000 mark several months ago, uh, grown from just under 16,000 uh, when we insourced. Um, and I guess the other, yeah, I, I, I think those percentages there uh, are, are just kind of reflecting the graphs that we just showed you. Swim school, interesting, uh, they've grown from just under 11,000 to uh, to that figure now, 11,820. And that's with the current blip built into it. Uh, we have just secured across the in-house sites a similar model to what our in-source sites had in terms of swimming lesson coordinators. So all they do really is facilitate waiting lists into the pool much quicker. We know we have a problem and some bottlenecks in waiting lists uh, and, and they're beginning to play through and take shape. So it's all moving in the right direction. The committee did ask us uh, last time, uh, we were about to last year, and we haven't done this for over a decade in the leisure service, but open some of our facilities uh, across bank holidays. Um, I believe it was done as, as a savings measure be before my time in Wiltshire, uh, back 20, 2012, 2013-ish. So I just want to share with you some of the uh, some of the facts and figures around this. So um, we trialled it in August bank holiday last year across four of our sites, one in each of the areas. And we're ten you might see this theme coming through more and more. Me and Ian talk about various initiatives uh, trying to at least hit the areas with at least one of these activities. So north, south, east and west of the county. We know we're quite a big site, uh, county. Um, we didn't, it wasn't fully opening because, you know, part of what we're trying to do here is be sustainable. So anything we're in introducing doesn't need to be at great cost. So we went into a single shift basis, limited opening times, limited staffing. Quite successful. Uh, sorry, Claire, we'll just, it's, it's okay. Um, 1,115 customers attended. So I, I would measure that as, that was successful, you know, it was bank holiday, August bank holiday, warm outside, we got a lot of people come into the, into the four sites. Um, the biggest challenge was staff, because back when we stopped closing on bank holidays, we wrote bank holiday working out of terms and conditions. We haven't put that back in, that would have been too tricky with some of the terms and conditions negotiations we're working on at this moment in time. But this was the goodwill of our teams that came in and operated these uh, facilities nevertheless. And important to also say, we didn't really sing this from the rooftops. It was limited to in the centre, we made our members aware, we put it on the websites and we did our social media campaigns. So no great hullabaloo about this. We didn't want any great expense. It was a risk. And if we can just go to the grid... Um, We've talked about the numbers that we, we pulled in. Uh, I'll just draw your attention to that net position. Two sites actually broke even and above. Two sites cost us to do that. Mm, did it balance up? Mm, not really. Cost us a few hundred quid. But it was the first go. And I think in terms of the amount of members and pay and play users we got, it's probably worth pursuing it and letting it become part of the norm again to see how far we can take this before we make any decisions on it. 
So if we just move to the last side, Claire, if that's all right. So going forward in 2024, there's only those Christmas time bank holidays when we won't be opening because it's just, you know, people won't come in at these times. They're busy doing other things at that time of, time of year. That's our experience of the leisure industry. But other bank holidays we will be opening uh, pretty much like we did last time. Uh, a few sites uh, and single shift operations. Uh, we've still got some tweaks that we're doing on Easter opening at this moment in time. And we're going to throw more promotion at it this time. So I'd be delighted if you wanted to, to keep you updated as to how that continues to progress. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'll go with Mel. Mel, question first, then I'll come to you, Chris. Um, it's very positive, very positive, and I love your graphs all going in the right direction. I'm just interested in why you think that's happened, and um, whether it's something to do with the price for your memberships, or I don't know, or something else. And then I was also interested in the school swim school because I know that there's a reduction in primary children in the county. So if your swim school is going up. Or more children learning to swim or where have you managed to find them <laughs> yeah i could probably sit here all day telling you some of the reasons behind it um what would i put the big reasons um uh we restructured a couple of years ago i think uh we've got a management team now that um uh, as a lot of experience in um, commercial leisure operations. We talk about utilising that for the public sector benefit all the time. So our model is not a commercially cutthroat one, um, but things like uh, paying attention to net promoter score results, um, having the right posts in the right places, uh, things that we've picked up uh, uh, across the journey of our long careers that we know worked are all firmly embedded in the structure now. And um, there is also the investment that we're putting into um, uh, uh, the estate across the piece. Ian's already referred to uh, Melksham, which was a raving success. I have to say that I monitor the figures on a weekly basis and generally swim school numbers and uh, fitness numbers are moving in the right direction. The model is one where we've got managers in each of our sites and they have ownership of those sites and drive the targets as such, uh, as though it were their own business almost. Uh, so it was a combination of, of several things. And a couple of years ago as well, um, we had a, um, a conversation with our colleagues in marketing and comms who are really comms in the council and are spreading themselves very thin over 350 plus services. We've now got our own marketing budget. So we're a bit more agile from that perspective and, and drive sales as well, a little bit more targeted than uh, we would do if it were a central resource doing it for us. So combination of all sorts, Councillor Jacobs, really. And I like to put a little bit of balance into the notion of kind of chasing income, chasing membership and, and so on in this. Um, we're much, I said earlier, we're much more about, you know, supporting the wider aims of the services, et cetera. And therefore, that's, for example, why we have put what I rather rudely call a dunking stool in every single swimming pool now. So the disabled access is there in every single swimming pool. We're... In the design of Trowbridge, there, are, there will be a living well particular suite which will be equipped for those people who, quite frankly, it's not appropriate for them They're to go into the, the, the kind of treadmills and everything else that the lycra clads are in. And so there's, there's more and more a focus for those groups that, that ne we need to be in there as opposed to chasing the dollar so to speak, in this. But we have to trace that dollar in this in order to keep the whole thing going. So throughout this, there's a, a balance in what we're trying to achieve. Okay, um, Chris. Again, thank you for the indulgence. Um, 
bank holiday opening review, I would hardly say that Carn is in the east of the county. The middle of the county, maybe, but definitely not the east. And I would consider Tidworth, which is well into the east. I don't know how it works with the MOD being there. I, obviously, there's issues, but, it, you know, Carn, no way is that in the east of Wiltshire. Having, sorry, first nod. Pardon? We'll buy, we'll buy a new compass. No, no I, come on. I'm just, I'm just going to come back on that, Council Williams, because, first of all, Ian invited suggestions, so thank you for that, for starters, because uh, that's the type of thing that we want. I think what we've tried to do, given that we're limiting it from 20 sites to four sites, is hit population density wherever we can, and I think you'll agree, sometimes the population density over in the east, because Pusey would be an ideal yeah, one as well, Pusey. to position in the east... Yeah. It's whether it's whether people we're going to hit as much, but I think what, the thing that we'll take back is we're going to have a, another look at that. Yeah. Thank you. I'm not being parochial. I'm not talking about <laughs> Ian McLellan. Yeah. I, first, first of all, a big thank you to the staff that's volunteered to come in, and it, it's. I don't have, it's sort of a question, sort of a statement. First of all, I, I've got no issue with you chasing dollars. I think that's a good thing, because the more dollars you get in, the more you can do and repay. It's not just sustaining the service, you can improve it and make more. And that's not charging, overcharging, that's charging a, right, a good price and more people coming in. So I, 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 I love the fact you've got a marketing person that's now geared up to that. And I... I my mind goes back to when Ian took it on that, that, and took the leisure services indoors that it would reach a sort of a, a degeneration state and, and you know, it's come in and it's, it's as though the, the, the staff are owning the leisure services. And I think that's, that's something for being a sort of political thing, your party, Ian, to, to grasp more because we've now gone away from the days of people's thoughts of, the, of a council being um although you see them park around the corner having a cup of tea into highly professional people managing and running and operating services with a pride so i, I as a, a person that likes it i like to see things in-house so well done on all of that and I don't think I got a question really. My question disappeared halfway through there, because because it's it, you know I think the only thing is do do you agree that taking it inside has given the staff and the management outside and inside a uh, an uplift in terms of this means something to us and the people that we're serving more than perhaps there was before and 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 the the, the buildings. Benefited also from you know the the the, the, um, the policies that you've implemented. Comment on that. I, I'm grateful. Thank you. Um, I would think if there is a, a morale boost to the staff because they know they're part of this organisation and they're part of the delivery, that I, I would absolutely agree with you. There are other models. There are other factors about well, what happens about VAT? What happens about NNDR and and is there a slightly different model or not? We may have to look at that in due course. But there is no doubt this has worked in our favour in, in doing this. It's allowed us to make a, a universal offer uh, across the piece. It has enabled us, because if you just think, at the same time as making the argument, if you're going to keep 20 ledger centres, if you're going to keep 30 libraries, you can't just keep them and then look for salami slice. You have to invest in them. And that is what we are doing. And so part of that morale comes from the understanding that we are investing in them. They are important to the, the delivery of the whole council's role in that. So I'm really pleased to hear you say that. Thank you so much. There's a, there's a lot to be done. We could spend a lot more than the money that's already uh, allocated to us. But we will only justify more money by proving success with the money we've been allocated so far, is what I keep telling these guys. Uh, Richard. 
first a preamble please don't take this as in any way a hostile question because it isn't uh, but i was i'm focused on your first so the first slide in this part of the presentation which presents some financial information which is good news on the face of it income is outstripping expenditure i'm aware that there was no measure of financial performance in the previous presentation related to libraries and I got in my mind a conversation I had with the manager of the local leisure facility in my division and that he is not responsible for the facility that he occupies and the facility's management budget carries a lot of cost and a good deal of income that's related to that building. Uh, now, I guess I'm asking two questions, one at a level of detail related to your first slide what's in those numbers and what isn't and then a second question directed to uh, uh, councillor blair pilling where is the overview at, at what level not in this presentation but uh, but when do we look at that all of the costs for example in the facility that 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 i know there's a library there's a a, 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 a school there are lots of other facilities in that occupying that building and at some point, the council must take an overview of all that. Do excuse me, somebody's calling me on my phone. I'm just going to get rid of it. I apologize. Uh, I'm get rid of it. Um, uh, thank you. I think it was your, my very opening comment was I said we, we, we look at the net. What you only saw there was uh, leisure income against leisure budget. Uh, we are roughly the in, in the leisure part of the world the overall cost of our buildings is about six million a year and so that profit bit in that is not a big chunk of that six million uh, and, but it goes back to my whole point of we got to do two things one is eat improve our financial situation so that we're re reducing the cost of running those buildings so it's less than six million eating into that by providing a greater surplus from leisure and whatever's left has got to be justified against those wider services that we provide so that's what we're working on in all of that in terms of getting the granularity down to each leisure center he will he will know that i've challenged him again and again and i and i have a, a deadline on getting this information but it's going to be end of this year we're working on it through this year so that we can identify each leisure center and every single aspect of their costs and every single aspect of, of libraries cost and see it and make those comparisons you have to ask yourself what so what question you're going to ask you're going to ask and what what decisions you're going to make as a result of all of that work and right now we've been very busy focused on the Trowbridge, focused on the improvements and what we're doing with the 10 million, focused on making the insourcing work, etc. But with the new um, Oracle system, financial management system and all that, we should be able to get to that point. We're not at that point yet, but we will. If you ask us to, yes, we will. Uh, you, you ask away, we, it's your, yeah? I'll give it some thought. <laughs> But, but don't, please don't ask for it next month. We've got two stewards on this side. Councillor Palman first, then Councillor Wainer. Thanks. No, uh, it's very encouraging seeing the figures and seeing this information. And uh, uh, But but I, I'm going to head off in an incredibly parochial way. And you've mentioned that this T word, Trowbridge, a couple of times in some of your responses. Is the planning application going to go in in March, like an initially intended? What? Oh, Planning application is not going to go in in March. Oh, yeah. It's scheduled to go in around August time, I think, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, and a general update. How, how are we doing then? So um, we shifted from Reba two to Reba three, which is a, an important element of the um, the sequencing in this last uh, earlier this month or last month. I can't I can't remember. The the thing we're tackling at the moment, we we know the place, we know the mix, we know the orientation. Um, we're, n we're now in a in a stage of looking at with the various design consultants and and planning of put together a um, 
they kind of draw on nationwide resources of, of planning experts, a panel to which our architects will be putting their proposals. The panel will be advising us because, you know, whether you paint it red, white, blue, whether you, how you do the roof, how you do this, that is still for debate within the experts at the moment. There is a, a board that is chaired by me. Do I, am I allowed to say it? Probably, but anyway, it's director place, corporate director place, the corporate director resources, director of public health, at my insistence, is on that board overseeing it. David's there and I'm there overseeing all these phases. Yeah, we are on schedule. Okay, so... Um, well, uh, schedule, the, do, do I know, is that schedule published? Uh, I... no, not, not the detail. Essentially, I think we will be going for planning um, just after the middle of, of this year. Who knows what happened? Planning is not a given when you, when you get to it. Um, but we are looking to have a spade in the ground in the early stages of next year and, and have it functional early 2026. Okay, thank you. Councillor Wheeler. Thank you. Um, I'm deeply impressed um, by the progress that's been made, especially in the leisure area. Um, relating to history, um, I preceded Ian Brayer Pilling back in 2009, being responsible for leisure centres, and back then I was known as Paul Shutter Wheeler because I was um, about to try and close the pool, and if I remember rightly, Westbury, which I never did, which was good. And back then we were struggling um, against the forces of evil to um, keep leisure, to actually hang on to leisure centres and hang on to libraries. And I'm pleased to say that we actually did. And I think what you're doing, we were pushed into outsourcing um, labour and um, against our own wishes. And I think what you've done about bringing everything back in house so you control the workforce, you control how the, you, you, you've got accountability, you, you, the managers work for you. And if they're not, if they're not doing their job, they can be, they, they can be directed to do things. You're not negotiating with a, with a supplier, so to speak, in the way that they are in highways, but we won't go down that. Um, I just want to say, that from my point of view, I think this is a success story. I think it's tremendous. And I think the way you are going is absolutely right, especially in, in, in building up the, the use of libraries in such a much, a much broader a much broader and socially aware fashion um, and making them relevant uh, to people who live in this county. I think it's great. I think it's a great story, Chairman. Yeah. Right. Ian, did you want to come back? A, a I did, yeah. I've got to spoil it all now. Um, going back to what we were talking about before and what Stuart's just alluded to, one thing that I, I can't get, and I think it's, it's still you guys, um, City Hall in Salisbury, which pre-COVID was driving down its, its cost to, the, to Wiltshire Council, to what I would call pennies by comparison to other, other things, and uh, that, if I say that when I was a Salisbury District Councillor, it used to lose £300,000. I think in the last year before COVID struck, it was something like £70,000. So, and that's a lot of years later. We're talking about the 90s through till now. So uh, you can see that now, given you know, my preference and your success of, of owning these adventures, and, and running them with all of the things that we've said about leisure, why are we handing over Salisbury City Hall to a private enterprise? And I, I, as, a, as a former entertainment promoter, I've dealt with a lot of uh, venues, and I always feared the ones not run by councils because they were rip-off merchants and, and charge you just to say hello. Um, and and you, I'd never went back to those places, but I went back to the ones where people were in place trying to give the service for their public that were coming in. And Salisbury City Hall was one of those. And it had a brilliant professional staff and um, not now there, but could be resumed probably or exhumed in some cases. Um, so, yeah, my, my, that's my thought. You got the drift. I'm going to start by saying... Um, you're fortunate that we have the director appropriate here. You don't have the portfolio holder 
appropriate here. It's not my portfolio, so I would not wish to be trying to answer your question today. But if, if David wants to add anything, you know, he can. But I think, you know, we're not really here to talk about City Hall, I would suggest. Yeah. Well, we, uh, in the widest sense, it is. Uh, Councillor McClellan, you're right. I, I, I took over um, City Hall operations back in 2018 as part of um, the expanding uh, group of services. Uh, I think we got it down with a lot of effort from a good manager, Phil Smith, back then uh, to about 170 a year it was costing us. That is not factoring in the building liabilities. We've just done a recent dilapidation survey on it. Probably needs about 2 million, circa 2 million. Yeah, well, yeah, but but... We've got the expertise, I'd say. We've got the expertise. Um, and operating, I think, across the land, um, councils are tending not to operate those types of facilities now. There are other models for that operation. And we're, ju we're just about to embark on, you know, if we can uh, sell the lease with um, a, a, a good, viable operator, then we'll test that model. Who knows, you know, how these things go cyclically, you know, when we get to understand how an operator, should we be successful, can operate that. Uh, at the end of the lease, who knows whether we might decide to make the plunge in again. But uh, that, that's where the trajectory is at this moment in time. But... Um, yeah. I, I, I would say it's not like for like, but it, there was always the danger of this going off at a tangent, but uh, we could possibly have that discussion outside of here, though I'm more than happy to do that. Okay, this is, a, this is, this is technically leisure, and I totally agree with um, you. Know, I worked with Edge and Phil Smith for three years prior to 2018 on trying to upgrade the data centre, and we were looking at the model of the Mayflower in Southampton, yeah. and that is now run by... Um, privately because we were trying to bring better entertainment and everything to the place there was a bit a lot of money needed spending on it and it's disappointing that covid came because i think we were just getting to the point where we could have developed it properly in a nice way i don't know if you want to come back on that and I was going to say, was we were in fact at one point before covid our, when i was still there we were trying to work it in with wiltshire creative uh, and, and, and work it in with the theater and and the art center and everything else and the then leader's dream was to create a sort of what I would call an, um, an arts hub down that end, move the library from that rather interesting building um, and, 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 and the gallery and put everything in, in that where the theatre is and everything else and use City Hall. And I think COVID probably was the final nail in the coffin on that one. But you never know, it could still happen. I, uh, certainly in this meeting, not take the parallel too far. We in-housed 10 leisure centres, the, uh, and the, the point of that was we now have a universal service across Wiltshire that we control. City Hall is, is a one-off in Salisbury. We're, we don't have that universal uh, coverage in, all, in the arts side of this thing, and there are many other factors at play in you know, who are the experts? Where, who do you relate to in the arts world as opposed to the leisure world in this? So please don't, you know, if you want to pursue a question about City Hall, please put it as a question about City Hall. Don't put it to the portfolio for leisure. Okay, uh, that to me. A, a great presentation. And I said, I served a long time on leisure and one of my biggest things was promoting health and wellbeing within the centres and the GP referrals. And I remember... At Trowbridge, the GP were for stroke, re stroke rehabilitation. I know it's still going on, but we had the old DC leisure at the Olympiad doing GP referrals there. The more you grow it, the more the people go and exercise, the fitter they are. We're keeping them out of the doctor surgeries for a start, keeping them out of the hospitals. It's all about how much you, what you get for your, I don't like using the word dollar, perhaps a euro or a pound. But that is how it has worked. And um, if you've got anything you want to finish with Ian, I'm going to move to recommendation. I've got one last point I want to make, and no, no apologies for it. We focused here on 30 libraries, 20 leisure centres, as opposed to the population of Wiltshire in this. And we are very conscious that not everybody can get to a library and a leisure centre and so on and so on. And so we are working very hard on, so what's the outreach model 
in this. And I'm not going to try and elaborate on this today, but it is a major part of what we're trying to address. Please don't think of this as just 20 leisure centres and 30 libraries. Thank you for that. Recommendations. One, notes the update. Two, receives an update on the bank holiday opening trial in due course. Three, receive a further general leisure services update when the enhanced financial information becomes available. Okay, all happy with that. Any can I have a, someone give me a proposal for that? Ian, and seconded by Richard. Uh, all in favour? Right, so well done, you three. It's been a great, great long afternoon. I'm well over. I am well over my hours here. I don't know what I'm going to do at this. So we've got to name move on to the next. It's, it's dope. I think it's been worthwhile. Um, Legislative has moved to 11. Task group updates. Now, we've already done one, which was um, Tony Councillor Jackson presented early, but do you know what? Very patiently waiting in the wings is Councillor Jonathan Seed. Um, welcome, Jonathan. I'm sorry you've been sat there so long. Chairman of the Speed Limit Assessments Task Group. So after your uh, presentation, Jonathan, I will see if any members of the committee. Oh, he's here. Here he comes. I am here, Chair. Uh, and I'm just, I have been listening to, obviously, to everything that's been going on here. Um, all afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yep, welcome. Right, thank you. Um, so, uh, the, let me just find my spectacles. The speed limit assessment task group um, has been set up uh, and has begun its work. Um, we've had one meeting on the 1st of March at which we undertook to scope the task with the then cabinet member, Councillor, Councillor Caroline Thomas uh, and, and her officers. Um, this was also an opportunity to understand the speed limit assessment process uh, and some of its broader issues and we discussed what evidence we need to undertake our work and amended um, our terms of reference. Um, in order to gain a perception of members' thoughts um, and their aspirations on the subject, um, as chairman of the task group, I've met on a one-to-one -one basis with each of our task group members uh, and the former cabinet member. Um, because there is quite a wide divergence of what people um, want to get out of this. Um, I've also had discussed the work of the task group with the cabinet member, uh, the new cabinet member, um, Councillor Holder, briefly. And I've asked uh, and been accepted for a one-to-one -one meeting with uh, the corporate director, Parvis Kansari, um, and, and his um, uh, subject director, um, uh, Sam Howell, are, in in the near future. One of the issues we've now got is that government has updated its guidance on handling of their guidelines on speed limits um, and the task group is meeting early next week to discuss this guidance. That in itself um, may cause us um, some issues uh, because um, it is ever so slightly ambiguous on, on, on its um, central point. Now, alongside this work, we are currently developing a forward work plan and will be looking at the evidence and hearing from witnesses in due course. And our aim will be to support a system uh, that has public confidence and is operated in a consistent and transparent manner. And within that phraseology is where the concerns are and why we are, um, why we've come together and why we're here now. Um, so I'm asking the uh, select committee to note and approve the membership of the task group and its terms of reference, which you have before you. Thank, Thank you, much, Jonathan. Chair. So before I take questions, um, we don't have any relevant officers here today for this part. Um, I think you're vice chairman, Derek. Yeah, 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 for this committee. Do you want to add anything to that, Sarit? Sorry. I'm a member of, um, of the task group, and I think that uh, uh, Jonathan has done a fine job bringing everybody together. Um, we, uh, we're, we're conscious of the fact that, uh, that yeah, underlying all this is basically Department for Transport guidance. Um, and as Jonathan points out, there's been a recent update, although it doesn't actually substitute for the 2013 guidelines. Um, but uh, 
yes, I think we'll be looking forward to um, uh, thrashing it all out. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Lay. Right, so I'm, I noted very much that you're talking about Department of Transport guidance rather than um, what we have to do. And of course, um, it would be useful, I think, in your work is to whether you can show whether there are cases where we don't have to follow the guidance because it's what the local community wants. And we heard earlier about, you know, the state of our roads and that we're going to have hopefully a freight transport review. Um, having lower speed limits on some of our rural roads, especially when they're narrow, possibly might mean that they won't become so much so popular as being rat runs because the whole time that the public drivers can do their 60 mile an hour and above they're going to prefer to use those rural roads rather than perhaps more substantial roads which is where they should be on do you want to respond to that jonathan or uh, yeah i think that's quite an interesting point um jackie but um actually uh, you could also say the opposite um, and the worst rat run locally here um, goes around the back of Devizes, um, uh, Conscience Lane. Uh, it is the most appalling third world road people ever drive along um, and uh, it does slow people down because they can't go low, they can't go more than about 15 or 20 miles an hour because if they do they'll end up at the other end without a car um, or a functioning car. Uh, so so they're, they're there are all sorts of ways of, of looking, interpreting that. And that's one of the problems, the, the challenges that we've got with the, with this task group. Um, and it isn't just the it, it isn't just the guidelines. It is the way that they are being interpreted and whether all guidelines are being interpreted the same way. And that is the one of the cruxes of the problem we've got that. Um, there's a feeling that among some members that that um, the uh, every bit of the guidelines is not being given the same weight, and that's where we where we um, where we come in, and we've got to, we've got to find a way through that and produce something which has public confidence. Which at the moment, um, I'm being told, and I think there is a in some areas there is a view that it, that that not it doesn't have um universal uh, public support and Derek may want to comment on that Derek thank you Jonathan um yes I mean the um uh, I, th I think Jackie your question really revolves around is it guidance and how much flexibility is well the the Department of Transport actually delegates the um the decision making to the local highways authority because it is local and the expectancy is that they're going to add local knowledge to that. Um, and I think there are some concerns that uh, that, that local knowledge is not being, um, should we say, garnered from the local community sufficiently well. And that elements of the guidance that uh, is relevant to uh, not the non-motorist, let's say, um, are not necessarily being, um, uh, are featuring certainly not not such that uh, we as members can turn around to our constituents and say the decision is being made i'm afraid against your your wishes but for these reasons and the difficulty is to be able to actually um, present those reasons so the objective i think is to have a transparent process whereby we can actually say yes we've looked at the guidance yes we've considered all these elements this is how we've applied the weightings, and this is the result. That's fine. Anything else, Jonathan, to add, or are we okay? Because I've um, made a recommendation. I think, that, I think you, 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 your committee is beginning to see um, the task we've got. And Simon, by the side of you, is smiling. Yeah, well, I think we've all got a rat run in our area somewhere. I wouldn't invest in our rat run. It stops only the people that know which way to go will go down it. If it goes, someone wants a bomb through in a rat run, and wreck their car when they should go the proper way as far as i'm concerned a bit bit i'm not being parochial it's not my area right, <laughs> right. um rec let's go to the recommendations on this one and the select selected committee one notes the update on the task group activity provided above two 
notes a climate emergency task groups forward work plan in, in appendix one. Three, appoints the membership of the speed limit assessment task group as listed in the report. And four, approves the terms of reference of the speed limit assessment task group. Do I have a proposal for that? Councillor Wheeler, seconded Stuart Carwin. Brilliant. All in favour? Good. Right. Thank you, Jonathan, for that. Um, we'll get tea and a bun or something. <laughs> We've nearly home. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I think we've got the forward work plan now, which is item 12. Um, just to be noted, is there, a, is there any, any comments on the plan from anybody? No? Okay. So, to, so the draft is just to approve the forward work plan. <laughs> Proposer, please. Sure. And seconded. Oh, up yet. Seconded. All in favour? Yes. Right, there are no urgent items. And I have to apologise, that is a record of three hours for that meeting for me. So I'm going to have to do the next one in one. And I apologise, but I do think today's been worth it. I think it's been very, very... We've got a lot of work done today and a lot. it's been quite a busy one. And the date of the next meeting is 4th of June 2024. Thank you, everybody, and have a safe journey home. <laughs>